Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Cassandra Gandara, Mayor Pro Tem for the City of Las Cruces. Mayor Mejishima is not here today, so I will be presiding over this meeting. Today is Monday, December 6th. It's 1 p.m. I welcome each and every one of you. If you would please stand. I would like to have a moment of silence for the senseless act of violence portrayed on our children in Michigan and the deaths of those children. Thank you. I'd also like to honor our men and women of LCPD, LCFD, all our military men and women for their service. Thank you so much for all that you do to keep us safe. And with that, Mayor, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Sorg, Councilor Sorg, please help us by saying the pledge. Thank you. Next up, we have Ms. Jennifer Martinez from the Communication Office for Pets of the Week. Hi, Jennifer. Hello, good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. I am Jennifer Martinez with today's Pets of the Week, and I just opened the wrong one by accident. There we go. Okay. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Marshy. Marshy is a one-year-old spayed gray, gray and white female she used to be an outdoor cat, but learned that love from people is very cool. She is vocal and demands attention, and she loves being pet. She's ready to be a house cat and hopes to be adopted this holiday season. And then we have Blue. Blue is a five-year-old male who's been at the shelter for quite a long time. He's had a lot of kennel mates and rooms to hang out in, but he is ready to get a forever family of his own. He's hoping he can be the best gift you get yourself for the holidays. You can meet either Blue or Marshy by calling the ASCMV to make an appointment. The number is 3820018. And keep in mind you'll need their animal numbers, which for Blue, the number is 5535. And for Marshy, the number is 39783. And I also wanna tell you about a weekend event that's coming up at Petco this Saturday. You can meet some of the other pets that are also available if you head over there Saturday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Jennifer. I always look forward to this segment. Isn't the cat beautiful? And they, the dog. They both are. Yes. I see um, Dr. Bayades coming up um, to discuss our jobs of the week. Thank you, Dr. Bayades. Welcome. Hi, Mayor Potem. Mayor Potem and members of the City Council, this week's jobs of the week are going to be First of all, we have a business systems analyst of being hired with the city of Las Cruces, and this position is gonna be closing in a couple of days on December the 8th. Uh, so if you're interested, you can go and apply as well. Inventory control clerk number three, this is from LinkQuest. These positions will be closing on February the 23rd of next year. These are actually supposed to be 2022. We will also have cashiers with the Salvation Army, and these are gonna be closing on February 23 for 2022. There's also CDL Class A OTR driver. This is with Wild West Express Incorporated, and these positions are gonna be closing on the 26th of December of this year. There's also a system administration lead with space programs with Paraturn Incorporated, and these are gonna be closing on the 26th of February of 2022. Now for a full list of jobs, internships, and volunteer opportunities, please visit www.employenm.com or visit governmentjobs.com forward slash careers forward slash Las Cruces. And again, the phone numbers for our friends with the New Mexico Workforce Connections are 575-524-6250, and their office is not far from here at 226 South Alameda Boulevard, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Thank you, Mayor Potem. Thank you so much, Dr. Payares. A very important aspect of our meeting is discussing any jobs that are available here in our city. So thank you. Okay, next up, we have the COVID-19 update by Mr. Enriquez, Eric Enriquez. Welcome, Eric. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem and, and Council. Uh, Eric Enriquez, Assistant City Manager, to give an update 
on the COVID-19 with the recent spikes, we felt it necessary to bring it back to council to inform not only council staff, but also members of the public on, on how things are looking. So in Doniana County, the case counts have increased. Um, they're in multiples on the left-hand side. I know it's difficult to see, but in 50, and it goes uh, from zero all the way to 350. So lately we've been seeing spikes in the 200 range um, taking place in Doniana County for the month of November. From November 1 to December 1, we saw about 1,000 positive cases in Doniana County. To update on vaccinations, um, Doniana County is doing rather well as far as vaccines go. Um, adults fully vaccinated, 130,000. Adults with at least one dose, 148,000. Children that are fully vaccinated, 10,659. Uh, children with at least one dose, 15,000. Registered in the New Mexico Department of Health portal are about 141,000. And those scheduled in that portal for dose, for one dose is 2,000, for the second dose is 4,000. Not registered in Doniana County is about 77,000 members. And that's based on the total of the 218,000 for the all ages in the community. So as a population for adults, we're looking at 78.5% of fully vaccinated individuals, those with one dose at 89%. Uh, the boosters were at 22.8%. And then we have the youth and child vaccinations of 27.1% that are fully vaccinated and those of 40% with one dose and 2.2% as this is fairly new we only have those with the booster. We have to wait at least six months before a booster can be uh, obtained. Uh, total population, all ages, we're looking at 64.3% for our county that's fully vaccinated and uh, those with one dose, 75%. Our hospital data is that uh, we've seen uh, with the total beds available, 566, and that, that's based on our two hospitals, Memorial Medical and Mountain View. Um, of the new cases in the county, 1,800. Uh, new admissions to hospital is 41 in the last seven days. What we're seeing is those that are hospitalized, 19.8%, but those in the ICU is about 57.9%. The big discrepancy there, the big number of that 57.9 is because the stay is greater. Once they're in ICU, they stay there a longer time in the hospital. Good news, you know, with, with all the people that have been vaccinated in our community and more and more treatment available, we have seen a drop in Doniana County with a uh, fatality rate. We're at 1.50 compared to that of the state. I believe the state is 1.6. The US is 1.98. Uh, and the world is, is at that rate as well. So definitely looking better because of the amount of vaccine and vaccinated people in our community. Other, other news items to report. Uh, there has been a drop in uh, adults because we've had so many that have been vaccinated, but we are seeing those with the booster just uh, slowly coming in. We're at 22%. The vaccine is, is available through different uh, point of distributions uh, at pharmacies and doctor's office. Uh, Las Cruces Public Schools is hosting vaccination sites also in five area middle schools this week and will provide booster doses for those vaccinated three weeks ago, as well as offer primary doses for anyone wanting them, whether adults or whoever, everyone's eligible. Uh, New Mexico Department of Health will no longer be operating vaccination sites uh, at their location. They have contracted with PMG to manage the vaccine efforts and further information on that will come. 
They've contracted also with the Las Cruces Public Schools and the schools are doing a test to stay program and potentially for future vaccination events as well. Uh, OEM is working with the state on some mobile female vaccination teams and that might come into the area January to help regular, to reach particular populations. I want to say in addition, uh, the Las Cruces Fire Department is also doing homebound, uh, doing mobile uh, vaccinations as well. And that's what I have for the report, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Eric, I appreciate that. Any questions? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Councilor Sorg. Thank you. Um, I can't get it on my screen for some reason in your presentation, I usually do. Um, but back there where at the beginning where it showed- Councilor Sorg, the, is it on? Your screen now? Yes? I'm okay. Okay. Um, yes, this, uh, this uh, vaccinations. Um, you show as many as 78% of the adult population is, is fully vaccinated. And then if you count everybody, it's 64%. Um, I just want to know in one of our resolutions today, for the ARPA money, uh, it was mentioned in one of those um, uh, bids on, on the ARPA money, they mentioned it was like 53.7% uh, of uh, the people are unvaccinated. I wonder where they got that number. Do you know of any number, or a group of people that are 53% unvaccinated? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Gondra, Councilor Sorg, no, I'm not aware. This is, this is all the data and the information that we get from the Department of Health on, okay. in their portal and the thing that has been reported to them. This is I, just Doña Ana County, is it possible correct. the whole state could be that way? Could I'm not sure. Out? Okay, never mind then. Thanks for the try though. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Councilor Sorg. Anybody else? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Enriquez. All right, thank you. Okay, Councilor Sorg, you're up for presentations and certificates of appreciation and proclamations. Do we have any? Are there no, there isn't any. There isn't? None, okay, moving right along. Um, we have now the conflict of interest inquiry. Um, does anybody on council to include staff have a known conflict? with the agenda items presented? None. 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 None for me either. Thank you. Okay, next up is public participation. Um, I'll be starting on my left. Um, anybody, yes sir, come on down. I'll give you two minutes. And Attorney Vega Brown, will you please monitor the, the time? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Nice to see how y'all are looking nice up there. <laughs> I'd just like to say that uh, we were Remember talking about- Remember to state oh, your I'm name, sorry. sir. Yes, ma'am. I, be, I, I be forget everything. My name is Rudy Rayad Um But uh, I came here today because uh, my, native, my native heritage background brought me here because we're talking about changing the name of a street. And I'm not sure, uh, I, my family comes from Spain and it also comes from South Dakota. And um, my grandma was, uh, she was one of the Sioux warriors and got a letter for patent for 168 acres over there in South Dakota from Harry S. Truman on the 33rd parallel. And uh, when I think about hearing the word squaw, I think of my grandma right in front of me the same way as I think of my grandma that was born and raised here in, in New Mexico for hundreds of years. And I think about, I don't know if everybody understands what squaw means. It's a derogatory f word for a female. It'd be the same thing as saying, I live on the BIT street, you know, but a squaw goes, and the native culture goes way deeper than that. It's, it's the most insulting thing a woman can be called in, in uh, American words. But uh, I appreciate that being brought up by council to take up that name change. And um, it's just, uh, it was surprisingly, 
I'm not sure, because if we were to change that in, an, and we'll say the Latin terminology and say call it something in Latin words, it it they would it would have never happened. But due to the dialect, not everybody knows, especially Native American language. Uh, I could see how it could accidentally be called the street, but uh, I'm just saying to let everybody know that uh, if you're proud for the to live on Squaw Boulevard, that's a shame. Because thank the, you, Mr. Adico, and yes, your time is thank you. thank you so much. Anybody else on my left? Yes, ma'am, please, or please make your way. Are you on the third row? You are, yes, come, please. Good afternoon, Council, and everyone gathered here. My name is Patrick DeSimio. I am a grant writer and program manager for Cruces Creatives Makerspace. Sir, may I ask you to lift the microphone just a oh, bit because yes. I'm unable to hear you very Certainly. well. Certainly. Is this better? Better. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Uh, and I humbly request that... State your name one more time. Mm -hmm. So sorry. Uh, my name is Patrick DeSimio. I am a grant writer and program manager for Cruces Creatives Makerspace. And on agenda item 7.3, resolution number 22-067, uh, I humbly request that the council motion to table this item uh, on the basis that the selection process uh, has not complied with uh, federal laws governing the administration of federal funds, uh, has not yet been able to deal fairly and transparently with Las Cruces' nonprofit organizations or follow a competitive process that will maximize the benefit to the people of Las Cruces. Uh, counselors, in your uh, reports from the Economic Development Department, which administered the process, uh, you'll notice in Appendix A, a uh, scoring matrix for the organizations deemed eligible. Uh, this process you know, is very thorough, but it proved decisive only for two of the three organizations, two or three organizations. The remainder, of the selection process was actually done at the eligibility review phase, which removed nine or 10 organizations uh, without any rationales. You'll notice that eligibility is mentioned with a single word, eligible or ineligible. Um, and <clears throat> this absence of a stated rationale uh, seems to be because economic development uh, did not document any rationales for its eligibility review processes. Uh, this is shown both in the report that you've received, Council, and by a freedom of information request that we submitted showing that economic development. Well, I suppose that's the time. Yes, but you asked for three minutes, correct? Yes, I did. Yes. Let's go ahead and give you an additional one. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, we submitted a freedom of information request. Uh, asking for rationales for uh, the eligibility review decisions. Uh, the documents we received did not include any rationales, any reasons for the eligibility review decisions. Um, and in the absence of rationales from economic development for the eligibility decisions, we cannot be confident that those decisions were accurate, consistent, or unbiased. We understand, of course, that the city must make difficult decisions on how to allocate the available ARPA funds, uh, and we'd have no objections were our organization simply not selected for funding. Uh, even with the scale of ARPA, the need is greater than the available funding can address. Um, but uh, we do firmly believe that Las Cruces must live up to its obligations to administer a fair and transparent process in administering the federal funding uh, Federal law requires this, the people of Las Cruces deserve it, and our organizations in Las Cruces deserve it as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Fifth row? I'm sorry, fourth row? Anybody in the fourth row? Yes, please make your way down, sir. Hello, uh, thank you, and thank you for coming to our CCIA meeting on Ms. Gondola. 
anyway, uh, my name is Richard Renault, and uh, I have a question. Can I speak on things that are on the agenda, such as guaranteed minimum income? Are you going to be um, here um, later? For I'll probably won't be here later. Okay. okay. Yes, okay. sir. But you'll have two minutes, sir. Two minutes total. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, can you start over? Yes, you can start over. Hey, that's good. Thank you. All right, I'll start with guaranteed min minimum income. Uh, it should never be implemented in Las Cruces. It's a line that should never be crossed. There's dignity in work. I was a supervisor at White Sands, and, I, and electricians, when they do conduit, it's a work of art. Some more refrigeration technicians, when they do um, piping, it's a work of art. It's something to be proud of when you work. I was a janitor when I was in college, and we would fight each other to do the best job cleaning toilets and things like that. There's dignity in the work. You can't ever let someone sit there while someone else is working in town. This mask. Um, so anyway, that's my uh, take on guaranteed minimum income. It's a line that should not be crossed. There is dignity in work. So, okay, one minute. Pickwick, it's out of business. They warned you, he warned you. I was here for all the minimum wage meetings <coughs> from 2015 to 2021. They ground Pickwick, they ground small business and cruises out of business. The minimum wage in Utah, in your city, uh, Mr. Peely, is 715. And so it is, it's the same in El Paso. They're kicking our butts economically in every way, and they have half the poverty. They warned you. I was here in 2018. It went up to 9.20 per hour, and a, a bilingual call center went out of business. 420 people, bilingual, Hispanic people, and this council let it go to 10. I was there. It was just despicable. We've got to do something. That was a nuclear bomb on our economy. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reno. Fifth row? Anybody in the fifth row? S yes, sir, please make your way down. And if I can ask folks that are wanting um, to state something at public comment, that you make your way down to the, to the front and what? ensure that you ha are physically distanced, if you would, please. Thank you. My name is Michael Latora. I'm a retired professor of English from New Mexico State University. I've lived in Las Cruces for almost 30 years. All of my children grew up here. I'm speaking on the topic of the temporary structure permission. I respectfully request that this be extended. It's important for many local businesses, especially restaurants. I know that some of these structures are much uh, more primitive than others. Some are flimsy, but some are quite substantial. The structure at the restaurant A Bite of Belgium is amazing. <laughs> I've eaten there many times. I've eaten at many restaurants in town, and this one cost a lot of money. I observed its construction from the beginning because I frequent this restaurant. And I, I think it would be a terrible message to businesses in this town if, especially under the pandemic conditions, a business invests a substantial amount of money in putting up a very beautiful structure and then is told it has to remove this structure. So again, I respectfully request that you extend the temporary structure permissions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Mr. Pearson. Thank you, um, good afternoon. Uh, the mayor was giving three minutes, so my t I, I'll try to read through this as fast as I can to make it under your two minutes or close enough. My name is George Pearson, and I am vice president of Velo Cruces, a bicycle and pedestrian advocacy organization. The city has identified many areas to work towards mitigating climate change 
effects. Velocruces joins with 350 organizations worldwide asking that all governments and leaders commit to significantly increase the number of people who bicycle. The webpage for this effort is at www.cop26cycling.com. Worldwide, transportation is responsible for 24% of direct CO2 emissions from fuel combustion, aside from the unsustainable levels of CO2 emissions that are ruining Earth's climate. Road vehicles are killing an estimated 7 million people per year worldwide. Bicycle represents one of humanity's greatest hopes for a shift towards a zero carbon future. New research shows that life cycle CO2 emissions drop by 14% per additional cycling trip and by 62% for each avoided car trip. E-cargo bikes cut carbon emissions by 90% compared with diesel vans. Swapping the car in cities for walking and bicycling even just one day a week can reduce your carbon footprint by about a half a ton of CO2 over a year. We urge the city to commit to significantly boost cycling. This can be done by promoting bicycling in all its form, forms, including riding to school or work, recognizing bicycling as a climate solution, creating and financing bicycle strategies, and collecting data on bicycling to know where improvements in infrastructure and usage can be made, focusing investments on building bicycle infrastructure and incentives for communities historically marginalized from bicycling. Specifically, uh, bicycle parking is needed to be incorporated in the upcoming zoning code changes, and uh, roadways must be designed using complete streets. Thank you, Mr. Thank Pearson. You. Ms. Martinez, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Putem Gandara, Mr. City Manager, and members of the City Council. I'm here today um, along with uh, the Cruces Creative uh, Leadership. What's her name, please? Apologies. Name. My name is Lori Martinez. I'm the Executive Director of Engage New Mexico, a local nonprofit who does education work and um, also a nonprofit who submitted a proposal for the ARPA funds that the city put out for an RFP. And I also am here to request that the city council um, halt the RFP um, process until a review of the, of the process can be done. Um, it's come to my attention that it, there appears to have been some um, fairly serious concerns with how the process was, with how the proposals were screened. Um, I think any of us who run a nonprofit understand that grants are competitive you win some, you lose some, and that's just the way it goes. However, as I understand it, there was a three-person pre-review committee that screened all the proposals prior to the proposals going to the full review committee, and there was no objective standard by the, as I understand it, that they used to determine which proposals moved on to the review stage or not. Um, what I maintain is that every nonprofit who submitted a proposal, who took the hours upon hours to do the proposal, get a fair chance to shoot their shot and be considered. Um, the public deserves to know what process was used, what standards were used to determine who was deemed eligible and who was deemed ineligible. When I requested um, to know why we were ruled ineligible, I was told by the federal guidelines we were not. Um, our proposal didn't meet the process. Um, I'm familiar with the document, and so when I requested to know what it was specifically that the, the uh, what was seen in the proposal that that I wasn't seeing, I didn't receive a response to that. Um, so I am requesting that um, every proposal that was submitted by every nonprofit have a full and transparent review. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Thank you. May I have Ms. Three York. May I have three That's minutes, you. please? May I have three minutes, please? Or can I have three minutes? I'm, I'm thinking I should give you two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem and City Councilors. My name is Jody York, and I own the Vita Belgium restaurant along with my husband, James York. Um, we've been in business since 2012. I'm here today to address our concerns of COVID and the safety of how it regards to our outdoor dining. 
Our COVID numbers are increasing daily. Our variant is currently in 16 states. The governor has extended outdoor dining currently through April 2022. We've met with the city officials and we have been fortunate enough to get extension to February 8th, 2022. I'm here to ask all of you for a one year extension for all the outdoor dining venues, not including all the other restaurants. I realize the mayor isn't here today, but I did get, well, I'm sorry, our venue is safe place for people who are not comfortable for sitting in diners. I realize the mayor isn't here today. However, I did receive an email from the mayor that he did say, I support keeping up the tent at least until the pandemic is over for whatever this is worth, probably another six months to a year or so. And along with my customer, Mr. De La Torre, who frequently dines, I have other customers that have their concerns too, and you may be receiving some emails. But that's all we're asking is an extension right now so that we can get through this pandemic so we have a place for our customers to die. Thank you, Ms. York. And yes, I'm confirming we got numerous emails. Mayor Pro Tem, ask her a question. Yes, um, Ms. York, please come to the podium. I think Councillor Vasquez has a question for you. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Uh, yes, may I ask uh, what official notice or correspondences you received from the city indicating that you would no longer be permitted for your outdoor uh, seating? We received, um, we got a um, visitation in October from the codes, and then we had a meeting with the city officials, um, the city manager, Mr. Nichols. They have given us, they gave us a six months extension at that point. Okay, and would you say that the uh, infrastructure or the um, the setup that you put together for the outdoor dining uh, is that something that uh, would otherwise legally not be permitted by the city if not for the COVID um, uh, considerations is that correct that's correct that's what we're being told that it does not meet the IBC International Building Code okay and for a permanent you... structure excuse me I didn't mean to interrupt no problem. And uh, are there major changes that you would have to make to, uh, for your outdoor space to be able to meet the IB, uh, the International Building Code? We are still waiting for the um, list of exactly what we have to do. That's what we have requested from Mr. Nichols um, because of the, um, in the International Building Code for our building and then there was, and I can't think of them, there's a special one for the tent structure okay. and we have not received that yet. And as we see Fe February coming closer and closer and our guests have told me, do not get rid of this tent. We do not serve in the tent if it's windy. Right now, today, the tent is closed because the wind has caught up. It started getting breezy. So we didn't even open the tent today. So it is a safe place um, for our guests. Thank you. I am fully supportive uh, of you and hoping that we can, hopefully if this is something that can continue even past the pandemic, sounds like something that uh, guests to your restaurant can enjoy, that we can help get there, um, you know, both with local regulations and restrictions, but also uh, to be able for you to continue this even past COVID because it sounds like people enjoy it nonetheless, despite uh, the COVID regulations. So I uh, hope that we can help get there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Vasquez. Just to add that um, I've met a few times with the Yorks and um, others to include a meeting with um, City Manager Peely and Mr. Nichols to include Mr. Enriquez. And we've extended that and just sort of talked about things that needed to happen. I think there's a number of issues. One, I think some ambiguity to the International Business Code, um, if that's what Ms. York is referring to, that she would like sort of a, a rundown of what is very, what is the city asking in regard to this membrane that the code requires? Um, but also maybe some inconsistencies um, from their perspective um, from fire and the alcohol um, um, permitting um, to include the the actual structure itself. And, and of course, um, I'm clear with them that we want to ensure that the, the public is safe. Um, and as Ms. York indicated, they do shut down and don't have 
um, availability in that tent structure when it's windy, the weather is poor, if you will. Um, and so I, I just want to, as additional information for you, but I, I too am hopeful that we can rec recommend not only for this facility, but other restaurants, maybe a six to a year extension on that tent. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Hello, Vic. Hello. Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors, uh, my name is Vic Villalobos. It's been a little while since I've had the opportunity to come speak to you all, but today I decided it was worth the trip, and I too am here to talk about the, the temporary structures that we have up. I think we can all agree that the last two years have probably been the most fluid in change in everything that we do. Um, I know when this started, my business was asked to close for two weeks, turned into months. We opened again and we closed again, and we opened again and we closed again. Restaurants were asked to open and close and be at 25%, be at 50%, uh, use a tent, don't use a tent. And I think when you look at what is going on today, our numbers are going up in, in COVID cases. We have a new variant. It seems every time we turn around, uh, they, they give us a new variant. And it would seem to me that the safety of people out there being able to eat outside is tremendous. I do eat inside restaurants, but I'm picky and choosy about where I go. I choose to eat outside a lot. Um, I like eating outside. Uh, COVID or not, I, I tend to like it. But, but I think that having the city council look at extending that for a year, I think that it's very probable that we could see another shutdown. Nothing, just because the governor currently does not have any strict things going on right now, that could honestly change the day before Christmas. And so I think the city council looking to extend that, and that extension would also allow people like the Yorks and other restaurants that want to try and bring those membrane structures into some kind of compliance to keep permanently, that gives them a year to work on it. So um, I do, I humbly request that you guys really consider that and take that into consideration here in the very near future. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Villalobos. Good afternoon, Mrs. Gondera and members of the council. Ma'am, will you please put the um, microphone down to your mouth? Thank you. Okay. My name's Elizabeth Ortega, and I would like to share my opinions. Uh, Squaw Mountain is a beautiful name for a street. I am part, you know, like quarter Indian in my ancestry, and I appreciate the beauty of the Indian culture. And when I see that street name, it brings back memories of the beautiful Indian culture. Squaw is a beautiful word. It's akin to wife. Are we gonna change streets that have anything about a wife because somebody thinks it's derogatory? It's silly. And what's even more of a concern is the fact that I have neighbors who are really up in arms about it because it means they have to send out all kinds of address changes and it's, it's a big inconvenience for them for such a silly reason is what I think. That's my first issue. The other is the guaranteed income. As an educator, I worked hard to teach my students the value of free enterprise and the importance of hard work for success in life. I think guaranteed income just goes into negating all the work we as educators do. Our country was built on free enterprise and hard work and guaranteed income is, in my eyes, a form of socialism to communism. We don't want to start people off on that kind of thing. I think it's very important to continue to promote hardworking ethics and free enterprise and not start giving handouts. We have enough that already goes out of our tax money to help those in need, and hopefully it's a temporary thing. We can continue to use counseling to get them back on their feet and get them working and active again. If they're disabled, we have disability, we have welfare, we already have plenty to help those who cannot work. That's my input for today, and I thank you very much for this chance to speak. And thank you, Ms. Ortega. Yes, thank uh, you for coming to our meeting as well. Oh, Anybody you're welcome. Any questions? Um, yes, um, hold on, Ms. Ortega. Councilor Flores has a question. Yes. Uh, yes. What do you base your um, What do you base your opinion uh, to say on? What do you base your opinion that state where you stated that um, uh, this is not a good 
program because it's uh, it follows a certain guaranteed income. Yeah. What uh, is it? What is it exactly that you said? I want to be sure that I understand. It just from what I've read about it, it sounds like it's just you know providing unearned income to certain individuals. And what does that do to that person or to our society? Well, I think it it. If, if you give handouts to a person, they're less likely to go out and work for it. What data do you have to support that? There's a lot of data. I mean, if you look at the welfare rolls, um, for years and years, people ma were... Ma'am, I have to interrupt you. There's a man by the name of Milton Friedman, and he was a Reaganomics uh, economist, and he uh, supported uh, guaranteed uh, uh, basic income. He was a uh, someone who believe that it would get rid of uh, welfare. And that was the purpose for having that kind of a, a guaranteed basic Councilor income. Councilor Flotus, I'm going to interrupt you at this point. Um, so I just, I just wanted to know what you were basing it on. And I don't think it's fair to the public or to yourself. And so that's why I asked the question. Thank you, Madam thank Chair. You. And thank you, Ms. Ortega. Councilor yeah. Flores, thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Ms. Ortega. Thank you for your opinion, and um, I appreciate the chance to speak my Thank you. opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Cruz. Good afternoon. Is that close enough? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Pro Tem Mayor and Council. Um, I'll, my name is Robert Cruz. I'm the chairman of the board for the Downtown Las Cruces Partnership. Um, and I'll keep my comments brief, but I would like to go on record as also asking that uh, item 7.3 be tabled today due to not only the reasons given by those that spoke before me, but I also, uh, our, the DLCP, has a number of reasons why we feel like this should be tabled um, and not to rehash what's already been said. Uh, we do feel, I mean, we do not have, and we're not arguing uh, with the merit or quality of the projects that have been chosen. However, we don't even know what those projects are. All we know is we've told that we did not qualify. When uh, also, uh, to reiterate, we have asked for additional information, which we have not received. Uh, of, of greater concern to me was the fact that we submitted our proposal on time on the October 14th deadline. And in the in-person meeting with the uh, qualifying council that uh, was vetting the applications, um, we were told that because we did not own the property, we were being disqualified. However, that was never made known to us. And so for me, as the chairman of the board for a nonprofit, to think that in order to put together a program that would benefit the community through um, doing, uh, assisting small businesses to get on their feet, get up and running, and especially those people that were impacted by, by the pandemic, it's a great concern to me that we have not been provided the information that, that accounts for our disqualification. Uh, it's been very vague, it's been very opaque, that we do not have uh, the right to continue on with this process. So I would ask that the council do consider uh, tabling uh, this agenda 7.3 item until it can be further reviewed but with the city and with those applicants that submitted so that we know exactly why and have an opportunity to discuss areas that might have qualified us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Hello, I'm Penny. Would you, ma'am, will you please move the microphone closer to your, there you go. Hi. Go ahead. I'm Penny Dunkley and I'm here to say, I think you ought to leave the tent up for by the Belgium. It looks beautiful. It looks strong, and inside the restaurant is excellent and doesn't look temporary or anything. The food is delicious. I live in the neighborhood, <clears throat> and it just looks very beautiful, especially compared to lots of other stuff of us that's around. 
So I just say, I think you ought to let them leave it up. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Appreciate you coming in. Hello. Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors, my name is Juan Garcia, and I have a, I have a couple of questions. Mr. It's, Garcia, move a little closer to the mic. There you go, sir. Thank okay, you. is this better? Uh, thank you. I have a couple of questions concerning this universal basic income. Personally, I have no issue with supporting individuals that need help. No issue whatsoever, because we all can be, we all may have been in that position over the years. What I do have an issue is, or I'd like to understand is, how is the city going to account what individuals do with that money? I don't wanna know about what New York is doing. I don't wanna know what California did. I would like to know what is the city of Las Cruces doing to monitor and hold people accountable for those 300, 500, whatever the amount is, and how is it gonna be spent? Is there a way of tracking this money? Is there a way of saying, this money is for this, but it's not for that? Or is it gonna be just a blank check that says, here you go, do what you need to do? And then what happens when you run out of time? This is supposedly a, a means of getting people out of poverty. A year later, two years later, that check dries up, and they're in the same situation. How does that help? That goes along with the same thinking of raising the minimum wage. So today you raise it to $12, then the same person that got that huge pay raise can't afford to buy a hamburger because the, the price just went up. So everything keeps, it keeps cycling back and forth. I, I'd like to know what kind of thought process our council has done in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Anybody else on my left? No, okay, how about my right? First row, second, I think I see um, staff, third row, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Anybody on my right? Okay, I think that concludes public participation. Um, I understand Mayor is on the line. He, yes, no. Yeah, he's, so Mayor is going to be calling and participating by phone. I will need a motion and a second. So moved by Flores. Second. Motion made by Councilor Flores. Second by Sorg. Second by Councilor Sorg. Christine. This is on the motion to allow the mayor to participate telephonically. Councilor Abeda Stevie? Yes. Councilor Vasquez? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Councilor Sorg? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Gandara? Yes. And I don't know if the mayor is on the line. Mayor, are you on the line? Is that you, Mayor? Yes. Uh, you guys had a lot of public participation. Can't hear you very well, Mayor. Uh oh. Well, me. Is there? Okay. Is that any better? No. It sounds like you're at, in in a tunnel, echoing. So we took a vote for you to participate and you're that's up for a vote. Do you vote yes or no? Uh, is, that, is that any better? Sorry, Mayor, no, it's not better at all. Not better at all. Well, okay, how about that? Better. Can you okay. hear Christine? No. Mayor, we're taking a vote to allow you to participate telephonically. Oh, okay, good. Do you vote yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, next is the acceptance of the agenda. I understand Councilor Flores would like to pull 6.2. Uh, I withdraw. Uh, Ma you withdraw? Chair, I withdraw. Okay, she withdraws. Ma Ma Madam Chair, did, did you guys have the conflict of interest statement? We did, Mayor. Okay, I don't have any conflict of interest on any item on the agenda. Thank you so much, Mayor, for that. Sure. Okay, Christine, to approve the agenda as is. 
I need a motion and a second. Yes, hello. Oh, so a moved. Motion. If a made, motion made by Councillor Flores. Second? Second. I'll second, second. it. Second by Councillor Abeta Stuvi. Christine. This is on the motion to accept the agenda as presented. Councillor Abeta Stuvi? Yes. Councillor Vasquez? Yes. Councillor Bencomo? Yes. Councillor Sorg? Yes. Councillor Flores? Yes. Councillor Gandara? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Okay, next up is 7.1, public hearing required resolution number 22-065, a resolution approving the request for a transfer of ownership and location of dispenser liquor license number 0162 to Bubba's Holdings LLC, DBA Bubba 33, located at 510 South Telshire Boulevard, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Can I get a motion? Move so moved. Approve. Second by Flores. Mayor Pro Tem, we need to do a public hearing first. Oh, yeah. oh I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> public hearing. Vanessa. Hello, Vanessa King for the city attorney's office. City, off, um, sorry, city. Um, senior office manager. And I'm here presenting the liquor license for Bubba's 33. Um, Bubba's 33 is located um, at 510 South Talshore Boulevard here in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, the applicant has, um, is requesting a transfer of ownership and change of location of dispenser liquor license number 0162. Um, the Alcoholic Beverage Control um, sent the applicant per, per, preliminary approval. And uh, we did request a waiver and extension of a hearing and that was approved. Staff reviewed and found no complications for the application approval. Here in this circled, um, this highlighted circled area is the location for Bubba's 33 that they are, um, where they want to uh, build. Council, you uh, have two options, vote yes to approve or vote no to deny. Thanks so much, Ms. King, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we will begin the public hearing. It is um, 152. Is there anybody approve and or deny? this transfer. Seeing none, now I get the motion. Now we need a motion. Move to approve. Second. Motion made by Councillor Sorg, second by Councillor Flores. Christine. This is on the motion to approve resolution 22-065. Councillor Abeda Stuvi. Yes. Councillor Vasquez. Yes. Councillor Bencomo. Yes. Councillor Sorg. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Flores? Yes. Councillor Gandada? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Okay. Next is 7.2. Thank you. I'm sorry. Resolution number 22-066, a, res a resolution authorizing the City of Las Cruces City to serve as a fiscal agent for Mesilla Valley Community of Hope Campus St. Luke's Healthcare Clinic, DBA Amador Health Center for Capital Outlay at the 2022 New Mexico State Legislative Session. And that's Madeline Shea. Yes. Hi, Madeline. Hi, good afternoon. I'll make a motion to approve Oops. before we start talking about it. Thank you. Motion made by Councillor Sorg. Second by Flores. Second by Councillor Flores. I want to get this in presentation mode. Voila. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, members of Council. Madeline Shea, Grants and Contracts Compliance Specialist um, with the Grants Administration Office. Today, I am bringing before you a resolution to authorize the city to serve as fiscal agent for the Mesilla Valley Community of Hope Campus, St. Luke's Healthcare Clinic doing business as Amador Health Center for capital outlay at the 2022 New Mexico Legislative Session. <clears throat> 
On an annual basis, the City of Las Cruces and many local nonprofit organizations have been successful in obtaining state capital outlay funds through advocacy with the local le legislative delegation. The State of New Mexico Administrative Code requires that all capital outlay appropriation recipients be governmental entities that own all assets and improvements resulting from the award. The Administrative Code states that appropriations cannot be given to a non-governmental entity. The item to be purchased or constructed must be owned by a governmental entity. Therefore, as uh, the municipal government locally, the city must serve as fiscal agent for local nonprofit organizations that would like to advocate for legislative capital outlay funding in Santa Fe. As such, organizations must have an existing fiscal agent agreement or a current lease agreement with the city and their proposed project must be listed on the approved state ICIP. Notification of legislative priorities from community organizations were due to the city this year by November 12th. Uh, the only one received was from Amador Health Center of the Mesilla Valley Community of Hope. Ms. Mesilla Valley Community of Hope has a current lease agreement with the city. Amador Health Center, a sub-agency to the lease, is requesting $760,000 to plan, design, construct, renovate, furnish, and equip improvements, including a sustainable roof, exterior renovation, security, parking, drainage, and accessibility for the health facility located on the Mesilla Valley Community of Hope campus. The scope of work will include infill construction of the property at Building 1, 999 West Amador Avenue, which provides space for reception and counseling services for people with substance use disorder, as well as office and meeting space. The work will include new construction to expand the building, interior redesign and upgrades, parking, landscaping, drainage, accessibility, and solar panels. The project is needed to respond to the growing need and demand for substance use treatment and mental health services. The Legislative Council service serves as a central data collection point for all formal legislative capital outlay requests. All community organizations must submit their requests with a written commitment from the governmental entity that will serve as their fiscal agent. Formal. Uh, Legislative funding requests for the upcoming 2022 session are due to the Legislative Council service by January 13th, 2022. Um, in summary, the Amador Health Center of the Mesilla Valley Community of Hope is requesting $760,000 for new construction and building improvements for build out of their mental health service facilities. Uh, and that concludes this presentation. I am happy to field your questions and have um, other staff here as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there any questions of council? Madam Chair, whenever you have a chance, I just want to make a couple comments. Yes, Mayor. Okay, I, just I wanted to say I appreciate all that the Sea Valley Community of Hope does for our homeless population. I'm very supportive of them. I just want to put it out there that I'd like to, in the future, have a work session so we can kind of uh, see exactly how uh, things are working and how we might be able to augment efforts to, to um, you know, reduce, if we can, the homeless population. I know it seems like it's, we're getting a lot more of individuals around the city, and I just wanted to see what we could do to help um, reduce, you know, either address those issues and possibly reduce the, and, and, and transition them to other uh, opportunities, you know, so that they can get integrated back into uh, into society. That's all, that's all I wanted to say, Mayor, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mary, I concur. Councillor um, Vasquez, I see that light very dimly from way over here. Maybe I should put my glasses on, huh? There you go, look at that. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I don't have any questions. I just want to say I support this, and I think, um, you know, St. Luke's is one of the, the critical services that we, out, we have to offer at uh, Community of Hope, and uh, I don't think we hear from folks at St. Luke's uh, a lot about um, some of the needs that they have, and I appreciate the city being a, 
fiscal sponsor or having the opportunity to be a fiscal sponsor for them in the capital outlay process, but um, it would be uh, great in the future to just better understand how St. Luke's is uh, part of the solution, as the mayor mentioned, to reduce homelessness and provide uh, health care services to those in need uh, and see if there are other needs for that community uh, that they serve um, and other needs for the clinic there. I think I took a tour there maybe about five years ago, but haven't been back and um, it'd be great just to better uh, have a better understanding of uh, what some of their future needs are in the case that they don't get this capital outlay money um, and that we are able to uh, perhaps kick in some city support to them um, as needed. So I just wanted to state that. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vasquez. I do have a question um, about the lease specifically. How frequently do we look at that lease, um, reevaluate, and include other additional aspects that would be important to the maintaining of that particular facility? Um, Mayor Pro Tem, um, I do know that the lease is renewed on a five-year cycle. Um, as to additional details on that, I don't have them. I don't. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, this is Land Demish, Finance Director. We don't have that information in front of us, but we can get that information and put it through with uh, Mr. Peely and send it out to the council. I think that's a very important point and we'll, we'll get that information to you. Thank you so much, Leanne. Yeah, it's, it's been a concern of mine about the leases that we have throughout the city related to city-owned buildings and how we obviously maintain them. Having a five-year cycle is concerning to me um, simply because, well, in five years, things change year to year, and I wanna make sure that there is uh, opportunity for not only the, the leasee, but the leasor to negotiate whatever issues and concerns they might have on a yearly basis. And I know, Mr. Peely, when you began, it was of an issue of mine, and you were working with Eric um, Martin to make sure that, that it was incorporated in a more timely basis. So I imagine um, that that, has, that is um, occurring but I just want to make sure and such a large, like $750,000 is a large amount of money. Um, I want to make sure that we're maintaining um, the building as, as, as um, regularly as we can. So thank you. Any other questions, concerns? Okay, anything from the public? Yes, come on down, sir. You come, if you, from the public, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Jeffers, you have two minutes. Thank you, my name is Vincent Jeffers, and I just wanted to, one of the people came up and spoke during public discussion was, he applied for the grant and he was denied, and the reason was, he didn't own the property. He nailed it. You guys may not have known what that meant. Many times, the city of Las Cruces commits fraud, nailing it by saying, we were denied because we didn't own the property. There are so many examples where you guys committed fraud. This is one of them. Again, this property was owned by a charitable trust, not by Cantina or Philippa Pula. And right, it would still be owned by a charitable trust, but you guys committed fraud because you used that exact technique you don't own the property. And then you turned around and you flipped it, you took it so many times. This is part of that fraud that consisted of the 1991 version of September 11th, where you guys drugged US service members, you put them right across the street, which you guys still refer to currently as the old county courthouse building. Others who have been harmed, they refer to it as the Antifa POW facility. It's the same group of people doing the same fraud. Some of the names are different. Maybe one or two people change out, but it's the same fraud. These are unhealthy relationships you guys enter into and then you maintain them. 
That's the future you're building for Las Cruces. More homeless, more people in need for assistance from food banks, and it's because you're scheming rather than doing real planning, economic planning. It's not right. It's gonna come and bite you one day. Watch. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Jeffers. Anybody have any questions need to clarify anything? No, sir, thank you. Thanks. Please come on down, Mr. Aragon. Hello, my name is Rudy Aragon. Um, 1999 Amador Avenue. I'd just like to say this council has really stepped up the game, what they've done for them people over there. Um, sometimes people fall. I remember almost 10, 12, 13 years ago when I had my first stroke, I came up here and I called the mayor a liar and proved it. But the email that he had, you remember, mayor, if you're still there. But uh, I'm still here. You know, I, I fell as a master electrician all the way down to, to bat to ground one. But uh, what you guys have done is unreal. I know it's hard because no homeless case is the same. And some people are suffering from, they say a mental illness, but uh, a lot of people are just broken, hurt, and can't get back up. And um, like I was saying earlier during the meeting, my family comes from South Dakota, and my family here is all dead. They're right there in the Messianic Cemetery in St. Genevieve's. But uh, sometimes when we fall, our, my great book says, you know, it takes a community to raise, you know, to raise one person. Well, a town back in the days is what they would call them. But uh, you guys are really doing a great job with that part, you know, because uh, commu the community of Hope needs you guys. And the, pop the population of homeless people is outstanding. And uh, there's no, the resources that you think that are out there ain't out there. You know, when you're trying to find a house and you've got unlimited amounts of money and you offer it even in, in your Las Cruces buy and sell, hey, I'll pay every, anybody that could give me a, a, a lease apartment house for, I'll give you $4,000. Real estate agents can't even get it for me. My, money's no good in this city sometimes. But you guys are doing an outstanding job and thank you. I support this 100%. Thank you, Mr. Aragon. Anybody else? Yes, please come approach the podium. I think that's Mr. Miss Martinez. The other Miss Martinez, yes. There are a few of us. Good afternoon, Nicole Martinez with Mesilla Valley Community of Hope. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Briefly, I just wanted to say that our lease agreement is a 10-year lease agreement with the option to renew every five years. And I can tell you, we've just trying to organize getting that done took at least a year. So we were really excited to get a really long lease agreement with the opportunity to renew midway through that. Um, we do meet with city maintenance uh, every other month, but we're in co contact more often than that. And we as directors meet on a monthly basis as well and have, we feel a lot, a lot of opportunity to interact with. Um, with city staff on maintenance and things that we need to do to improve the property or that we feel might be city responsibility. Um, and I also just wanted to put forward that the master plan is underway and we've had a lot of interaction with the consultants in the city on that. And so I think that um, to Mr. Mayor's request that that will be a really good opportunity to revisit lease agreements and how all of that's going, especially with um, the new uh, things that will be happening that the master plan will illuminate for all of us. If you have Thank any you, questions. Nicole. I really appreciate that sure. update. I think that's an important Great. piece to it. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else on this item? Okay. Seeing none. Christine. This is on the motion to approve resolution 22 066. Councillor Beta Stevie? Yes. Councillor Vasquez? Yes. Councillor Bencomo? Yes. Councillor Sorg? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Gondola? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Thank you so much. Next up, 7.3, resolution number 22067, a resolution adopting funding priorities and allocations to various Las Cruces nonprofit organizations for the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds established by the American Rescue Plan Act. May I have a motion? Move to approve. Motion made by Councillor Sorg. 
second, sec second by Councillor Bencomo. Good afternoon, Natalie. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, members of council, Natalie Green for the record. Again, Natalie Green for the record. The action item before you is a discussion on the American Rescue Plan Act and the ARPA funding recommendations. Excuse me, so I wiped down, sorry. Uh, just a little background for the council. Uh, the city was notified that it would be a recipient of $24 million in direct funding from the U.S. Department of Treasury. It will receive that funding in two tranches. The first was received in May 19, 2021, and then we anticipate the second tranche of $12 million in May of 2022. Council had two work sessions on the ARPA funding. The first was June 14th, and then the second was August 9th to specifically discuss the RFP process and the eligibility review process. Council also took action at two separate meetings. The first was August 16th. Again, that was to allocate uh, the ARPA funding to its specific categories. And then the September 7th, which adopted the RFP process. Uh, Council awarded approximately 10.4, it's actually less than that. It's $10,371,156 to the Community and Economic Development Initiative, RFP. And then it also allocated funding to various other uh, categories as outlined by the statutory requirements. Uh, council adopted the, or ARPA can be used for a number of activities. The eligible uses are in the ARPA interim rule statutory guidelines. It is for, and these were incorporated into the RFP process. So it is for programs or services that support small businesses or nonprofits organizations to mitigate economic impacts as a result of the pandemic. You can also help small businesses with technical assistance, counseling, and other planning needs. You can also, uh, implement services to impacted industries such as tourism and travel, and then services to direct household assistance to address the negative impacts of COVID-19. Uh, other uses uh, that were specifically called out in the ARPA guidelines were to facilitate access to health and social services, addressing housing insecurity or the lack of affordable housing or homelessness, and then again to mitigate those health impacts as a result of the emergency on education or education programs and promote uh, healthy childhood environments. Uh, at the September 7th, 2021 council meeting, it was the formal adoption of the RFP and policy guide. Um, I believe that is attachment in your packet, I'll have to go back and check. It incorporated all the feedback from the August 9th council work session. It uh, limited applicants to 501c3 or 501c organizations. It outlined minimums and maximums. It formalized the committee evaluation process and the scoring matrix. It also outlined an assessment of risk and organizational capacity in compliance with the federal regulations and delineated uh, the timeline. And then it also authorized staff to make any changes as necessary as a result of the public health order. Uh, the evaluation process was a competitive proposal process. Staff received 21 applications requesting approximately $26.3 million. Uh, an eligibility review committee was uh, part of the process. There was three non-scoring members. Uh, those three members were myself, Amy Basford, uh, Johnson Basford from our grants department and Jonathan Macias, uh, a member of uh, a consultant hired specifically to assist with ARPA. Uh, that il eligibility review process included a statutory review of the projects. So we reviewed those projects for eligibility based on the ARPA interim rule and the statutory requirements as well as organizational capacity and the submission of uh, the required components of the RFP. 12 of those applications moved forward to the ARPA Review Committee. That was a committee who was a scoring committee who scored based on the scoring matrix. There was nine members of that committee. 
They each scored the applications individually and then met as a group and they received presentations from those 12 applicants and got any questions answered that they may have had. Uh, the scores were then uh, uh, totaled. We removed the highest and the lowest score uh, in accordance with the ARPA guidelines or the RFP guidelines and then took uh, the ranking off of that. And then the committee met on November 9th and reviewed those scores and those rankings and uh, has prepared a, a recommendation for council today. We also went out for a public comment period. We advertised uh, through a press release what projects were being considered for funding and then uh, today's uh, action is recommendation to council. Uh, the scoring matrix covered a number of items. The first was project justification. How does it address those uh, response to COVID pandemic or the negative impacts as a result of the pandemic? Did it meet uh, city goals? What was the community impact, uh, the, bad, the budget, um, duplication, the feasibility of the project, uh, the organizational capacity, and then the quality of the proposal. Uh, the committee recommendations are as follows. Uh, Mesilla Valley Community of Hope, and these are rated from highest to lowest as they received in the scoring. And all the scoring was also included in your packet. Uh, the first was the Mesilla Valley Community of Hope was recommended for the Housing Risk Mitigation Fund for 600,000. The Community Foundation of Southern New Mexico, $2 million. The Community Action Agency of Southern New Mexico for the Guaranteed Basic Income for $1.7 million. Jardín de los Niños Flourishing Families Infant Mental Health for 350,000. Catholic Charities of Southern New Mexico for the COVID-19 Recovery Fund for 550,000. Uh, the Peachtree Affordable Housing Project for 2 million. The Boys and Girls of Las Cruces uh, Facility, 1 million. And the FYI Therapeutic uh, leisure program for 1 million and then the Oak Street Apartments for 350,000. So that comes up to approximately $9.55 million. Uh, the applications that were, that were determined eligible but were not selected for funding were the Crosstown Flat Affordable Housing Development uh, for $2 million, the Downtown Las Cruces Incubator Program for 1.7 and the Lift Fund for 2 million. Uh, the applications determined not eligible based on the statutory requirements were the Community Options Daily Planet, the Desert Community Wellness, Cultivating Community Wellness, El Calvario United Methodist Church, Casitas de Calvet, Calvario, the Engage New Mexico Habitat for Humanity, um, an outdoor recreation program, the Doniana Arts Council, La Casa, and then uh, the Economic and Educational Recovery uh, community maker space by Crucis Creatives. Uh, the ARPA review committee, those nine members were made up of city staff. The chair of that was Mr. Ikani Tamopiao. Uh, we also had uh, David Weir with community development, uh, deputy director, Jan Lauterbach and Kevin Wilson, housing development coordinators with the economic development department, Lynn Gallagher, the director of quality of life, Mandy Gus, the director of your public information office, uh, Rebecca Slaughter, your Deputy Director with Quality of Life, Shrijana Basniat, your Performance Manager, and Will Blanchard, uh, an, a Budget Analyst with the Accounting Office. Uh, the members were selected based on their professional experience. Again, we had such a varied um, group of projects. We wanted to make sure that we had community programming, economic development, affordable housing experience, and again, that score, non-scoring eligibility review committee was made up of Amy Basford Johnson, Natalie Green, and John Macias. Um, the next steps, uh, depending on the council's decision today, it would include a development of an ARPA agreement, uh, contract negotiations and development, and then council action for each uh, contract. All the contracts, if approved today, are over the 75,000, so they would need to come back for council approval, and those would be performance-based contracts. And then I'll stand for your questions. Thank you, Natalie. Any questions from council? It's Councilor Flores, Councilor Pincomo. Then when you have a chance, please get me last. Fine. Down, Mayor, thank you. 
Go ahead, Councillor Flores. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Natalie. Have you heard of Benito? <laughs> okay, seriously, um, uh, we had two organizations here today, uh, Patrick and from uh, Cruces Creatives and another, I can't recall. At any rate, um, and I believe it was Patrick who said that they didn't receive any uh, response to, or whatever, one of the two, maybe the two indicated that they did not receive any uh, response to their inquiry as to why they were not selected. So, um, so my question is twofold. Number one, did you notify them as to why they were not selected? And then um, follow up, uh, if not, why not? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Thank Councilor you. Flores, uh, they were notified that they were not eligible. Specific reasons were not given as at the time of the request, this was an active procurement process. Again, this is still an active procurement process. So until council has determined their final decision, um, there was limited information that we could tell them. Now, all of the scoring, uh, the reasoning, the scoring matrices, all those were published as part of the uh, ARPA packet that you have in front of you. So. <clears throat> but if it's true that they didn't receive a reply from the city specifically to their inquiry, why? At, at the time of their inquiry, the reply they received was that there was limited information because this was an active procurement process. So then they're left in the dark as to why they didn't qualify and if there's an opportunity to qualify in the future, they still wouldn't know what they did wrong or what they were missing. Staff will be happy to review their applications and the errors in their applications if that is the will of the council. Is, 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 do we need a special motion for that? Uh, ma Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mayor. Can I add, just make, so, Councillor uh, Flores, thanks for asking that question. Let, let me just ask a real quick question of Natalie. So, Natalie, I, I know that the city's yeah, handling this as though it's a request for a proposal. H however, this is money that probably a once in a lifetime that we get from the federal government for ARPA. Does it have to be handled that way or can council themselves act as though um, a selection advisory committee with staff um, presence and, and, and um, you know, look at these various applications and um, kind of score them based on our own criteria. Is that possible? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, the RFP was a council adopted process. Uh, the council can allocate those fundings that they see fit, although I think there is a misconception that because it's ARPA, it's flexible. And to a point that is true, it's flexible in its inflexibility, right? Uh, it's flexible in that you don't have to income qualify like you would CDBG funding. It's flexible in that you don't have to necessarily comply with the requirements of anti-donation. However, it is not flexible in the federal regulations. There still are statutory requirements for the use of the funding. So, uh, and it's not just in the interim final rule, it is in 2 CFR part 200 that we conduct at minimum a review of risk and that was outlined in the council um, work session. No, so. and, and I appreciate that, and Madam Chair, if I may. I appreciate that, Natalie, and, and I'm sorry for the choppy phone coverage here because I can kind of hear it echoing also. But I think what Councilor Flores was asking and I would support is an opportunity to, in a public venue, to basically um, discuss all the proposals and much like we do anything else, just kind of um, rank them or score them from council and why we choose one over the other. And it's, that way there, uh, everyone could be available and they could watch, and they could hear and see exactly what council uh, supported and doesn't support. And we still might be able to get it done 
in time for Council <coughs> Sorg and, and Vasquez because I think we have one more council meeting. And, and normally how we used to do it is we have old business, which this would be considered old business, and then new business, and that's when the new council comes on. So I'll just throw that out there for my colleagues if they want to move in that direction. So, Mayor, paper time. Yes. If, if um, I may, I just... And, uh, Mayor, Mr. Pilly has some comments to that. Sure. Sure, of course. I just notified by uh, legal. So if we were going to do that, we would have to table and then uh, the RFP process was approved by resolution. So we would just have to table, amend that and um, process through resolution before we do that. And, uh, but that's, that's it. So what you're saying is we would have to um, table this, amend that resolution, right? And then vote on it. Yeah, because we voted on the process the right. way it, it stood. Right. But in order to bring the applications for council to review in that way, it would be an amendment to that resolution. Okay. And, and, and I will, if I may, Madam Chair, will mention that next work session, I was about ready to, to, to council it because we didn't have anything to discuss. If, if you choose to, and my colleagues choose to, we can use that time you know, four hours or five hours, whatever it takes to hold basically that work session on this item specifically and and then vote on it the following week. And like I said, I think Councilor Sorg and Vasquez will still be available to vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Flores, do you have other questions, concerns? Uh, what exactly was the mayor's proposal that we uh, utilize next week's work session to fully discuss this and spend the entire work session on that since it has been canceled? Yes. Okay. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. you Councilor Ben Cobo. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you so much, Natalie, to you and your team um, and for all the community who um, apply for these incredibly important funds. Um, I have a couple questions and then I'll comment on the proposal. Um, Natalie, can you, oh, do you need some time? Okay. Go ahead, Councilor Pinkelman. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Um, the, there was three projects, I believe, that were eligible but not recommended. Is, is this the same procurement process? You can't talk about specific, more specifics today? Councilor Bencomo, I'm happy to talk about these specific projects. I, I can talk about issues with all the projects if that's the, the desire of the council. Today? Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the process, the mayor um, proposed that we, that the council review the applications themselves. So they bring it and you go through each that was an outline in the original process, the RFP process, where we had a committee that, that does that. And because that was passed the resolution, mm -hmm. uh, you'd be going outside of that process. And so you can, you just need to, by resolution, change, change that. So not we today. It. Well, <clears throat> I think that's a little different. She said she can go through and talk about some of the, some of these, uh, the, my understanding, some of these applications. But if you're gonna go review as if you were, um, the committee to decide, right? Um, I think that's a different. Okay. So, topic. okay. Well, I certainly mostly have questions about these. And then I guess if I was, if we move forward with that and wait till next week during work session, Natalie, can you put the top five up there? I would at least, these top five are excellent projects. They're projects that are a direct injection into our community's well-being, um, to the quality of life of people because of the pandemic. Every single one of these projects to me feels right on the money. Uh, what ARPA was intended for, what um, we hope that people are, you know, being visionary and using this, these kinds of funds, these, like Mayor said, once in a lifetime funds. If we do this, I would like to propose that we move forward with the top five projects and, and have these other discussions around the other projects, if that's what 
the council desires, which I would be in support of, honestly, either way. But as I look at these five projects and as I look at their, in their package, their proposals, they are excellent projects. I have a hard time change, you know, thinking about changing my mind on these top five. They're powerful. So that would be my suggestion. And then I did want to raise, though, a different issue, and that's on the committee selection, Natalie. I had, as I was reading this, I had some serious concerns about the lack of demographic representation on the committee, um, the lack of pe number of people of color in the committee. I think it's something that I really wanted to raise, and it's something critically important that we have to look at moving forward in any committee selection. Um, it is not okay that the majority, uh, that there was very, if anything, one or two, I don't necessarily know how everyone identifies, but um, it was predominantly white folks, and I think it's really critical that we have a diversity of um, certainly race, but also not just administrative folks, right? Um, I don't know what the policy is on that, but it, it seemed to be all made up of admin folks, um, and I would like to see a diversity in the type of role they have within the city as well. So the, I'll stop there, Mayor Pro Tem, but um, like I said, I would at least like us to move forward with the top five projects because as I'm looking at them, they seem urgent in the moment we're in, um, particularly to uh, support the people that have been hit hardest by the pandemic, which, is, which are people experiencing poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bingomo. Um, there's more than five, though, that you're recommending to the council. There's nine projects. No, no, Mayor. They're the top five that Natalie showed on here. These were the top five, and she said that these were scored. The way they presented them, this is how they scored the highest because of the matrix. Mm -hmm. Can you go to, yeah, the one before, Natalie? They're the top five. That's what my suggestion is. I, I understand, but there's nine that, I, yes, I you understand. know, from top to one through nine. Mayor Pro Tem, I do want to clarify that uh, the procurement, not being able to talk about the procurement was with the nonprofits, not with the council. So, uh, so we can discuss uh, some of these projects in detail. Staff did anticipate having to do that. And I do want to say that I did include a description as requested in your packets um, with the uh, abstract of the projects as, as mayor had requested uh, as the applicants wrote it. So that was included in your packet as well. Yes, thank you, um, Natalie, I did see that. So Councilor Bingomo, you asked a question, you had, or more specific questions on the four, three or four that, that got um, omitted from the entire process. I think Natalie has explained that she can go over those Great. each. Are you still amenable yes, absolutely, to doing Natalie. that? Yes, absolutely, Natalie. And it was the three that were eligible but not recommended, if you could talk about the decision making behind that. Okay. Mr. Mayor, Councilor Bencomo, that really has to do with the scoring committee. They reviewed all the applications and they determined those ones to be um, they chose not to rank those based on the scoring. They were the lowest scoring uh, applications. Um, there was some concerns on some of them uh, about duplication, um, about the viability of the projects based on what was uh, presented in the presentation. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through those really quickly. The Crosstown Flats uh, was uh, part of a competitive, another competitive process. There, so there was a concern about reserving $2 million for uh, a project that may not be awarded other funding and that was contingent on the other funding. Uh, the downtown uh, Las Cruces partnership. Uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, if I can, sorry, Natalie. Yes, just, sure. If I can interrupt, I, we just, uh, Jennifer, I just, we're just talking about uh, whether we, we can or not. The fact that it's an open, the RFP process still open our process, so our RFP process would be it would be violating that. So to be able to talk through each one of these, I think that's what we've landed on in talking to our finance director and uh, attorney and, and city auditor. Which so 
Okay. That's what we've landed. We've landed on the fact <clears throat> that because it's an open RFP still until the council approves, uh, we, we cannot discuss. I have a question for uh, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, so uh, if we were to bifurcate and um, not discuss, not necessarily discuss the first five, um, but that if we were to vote, well, how would we ever be able, that, well, Natalie, um, this is not set in stone and there's still like uh, half of the money remaining to be allocated, right? This huh. is it, it's going to, half of it, all of it will be distributed to these entities, to these 501C uh, in, entities um, now and then later and that's it. There's no, there's no more. So uh, the recommendation processes. was up to $9.5 million. There's approximately $10.3 million on the table, although from that 10.3 has to come uh, the administrative costs, uh, our administrative costs to manage and operate the compliance with this program. Okay, so, so then uh, all the funds would be utilized at, at right now. Okay. So, so there was approximately 10 million uh, to give out to nonprofits. Okay. And again, there was $26 million in requests. Okay. So if we were to bifurcate, well, no, that doesn't make sense at all. We can't discuss the RFP because it's wide open. The process, we're in the process, can't be discussed. So, okay. Thank you, Ethel. I'm sorry, Mayor Thank Bertram, you. I, I Thank think you, Mayor. Thank you. I still have a, just yes. one more question, actually. Go ahead, Councillor Bincomo. And Natalie, my other question was around the total number. I noticed that there was a couple projects in the top nine that were awarded partially. I'm curious if there was still funding left. Um, I did the, probably did the math wrong because I thought it was 10.4 and I thought there was about 850,000 still left. Why were those two pro, can I, Okay, this is difficult because I want to know why those two projects were only partially funded even though there's still some funds left. So the committee felt uncomfortable awarding the full requested amount based on uh, what was in the proposal and the recommended budget. Um, one of the concerns that was brought up was cost allocation, so two, in, two CFR 200. Um, and in the compliance reporting guide that limits the indirect um, administrative cost to 10%. Um, some of the costs in the one application was uh, well in it over that 10% threshold. Um, again, that would come down to contract negotiations because we would have to review those administrative costs to ensure that they are direct costs, so in 2 CFR part 200 when it talks about cost allowability, um, you have to, they either have to be direct costs to uh, the actual grant as a result of the funding in the grant project, or uh, if they can't be attributed to direct costs, then it's an indirect cost and that, that rate is capped at 10%. So there was a question around uh, some of those requested line items and whether they were indirect or direct cost to the grant program. Um, it's, the city has to go through the same exercise um, with our grant funded programs. Uh, so we spend CDBG money. If the city wanted to uh, charge the CDBG program for the use of the copier um, and it wasn't charging other grants equally or other non-grant programs the same, the federal government would have an issue that you were treating grants versus non-grants uh, differently. So again, some of that has to do with the review process and uh, as part of that, we'll look at the organizations and all the total budget and, and I'll use the line item for electricity. Um, so we'll look at their total electrical costs for the year and how that is spread across the organization's line item budgets and then determine if that cost is reasonable based on the regulations and the cost allowability. Thanks, Natalie. And because of the way the procurement and the RFP is set up, are you able, you're not able to then talk to the nonprofit, the proposed, the person proposing this to let them know how potentially their proposal would shift with less funding? 
both the presentations and the scoring and ranking were public meetings and those organizations were invited to those meetings. So they did listen to uh, the, the committee and their concerns and, um, and the, fi the final decision, so to speak. Okay, thanks Natalie. I definitely, you know, I would love to hear, I'm sure we have public comment here today, I would love to hear that. Um, I think my, my only sort of caveat with discussing all of the projects, how many total applications were there, Natalie? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Brincomo, there was 21 that were submitted. So my only caveat with us discussing all 21 projects next week is that we're gonna fall in love with all of them and only partially fund a bunch of them. And, right, and I feel like that's gonna um, water down the the power that is in some of these proposals. So I think if we're gonna do that, potentially we would also still, we would have to come up with some um, measurements for us so that we're not doing what we said we didn't wanna do at the very beginning of this process back in May or whenever that was, right? Which was give a bunch of tiny grants to uh, a big group of nonprofits and then they're not able to do fully what they're intending to which is the reason I was suggesting the top five out of the top nine, because to me, those are incredibly powerful and seem direct, direct economic relief. And so that was, well, that was my suggestion. Um, I'm okay if folks don't agree with it and if we move forward with discussing all of them in the, in the next couple of weeks, that is just my biggest concern that we're gonna end up watering down. And, um, and staff does wanna clarify that uh, a decision of non-eligibility or a decision of non-recommendation is not a reflection of the organization of the pro or the project. You know, there was some really great projects that were ineligible, but they are not allowed under the ARPA guidelines. And so as much as we would, we think they're great, again, they didn't meet the spirit of the RFP. Um, I will tell you the Oregon Mountains, uh, a hiking trail website, uh, a GIS website, great idea. Doniana Live Work Art Spaces Feasibility Study. Great idea, oh, Natalie, but it's not eligible shouldn't. under ARPA. Well, those were all in the packet though. Yes. So I'm glad you said that actually, Natalie, because I did want to just make that note, and I would love, like I said, Mayor Pertan would love to hear public comment, but I did want to make a note on, along that line, Natalie, around how inspired and um, surprise, not even surprise, there's so much talent in this community and I would love for us to make sure that um, we find ways that we partner with these uh, community organizations and community leaders to figure out how we fund some of these incredible projects in the future. But, um, you know, it is limited in amount of money and we knew it was gonna be competitive. So um, thank you for making that note, Natalie. And thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Councillor Bencomo. Councillor Abeita Stubi. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, and thank you, Natalie, for the presentation. Um, as we've talked about this, um, I don't want to re-ask other questions, but I just wanted to note that I am in favor of um, the proposal that Mayor had to talk about this a little bit more thoroughly and within the guidelines that we need to so that we can have that kind of transparent discussion. I think that we've heard today that the public wants to have just a little bit more about these projects. Um, and that's all, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Councillor Bakas to be Councillor Vasquez. Thank you. One moment, Mayor, I got you down. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, I just wanna say, I want us to be very careful with discussing um, and breaking the rules of the RFP here. I think uh, if we are to make an amendment to the existing resolution to uh, modify the RFP process so that we can discuss these at a work session. Um, I don't wanna put any of these projects in jeopardy um, or this process in jeopardy. And I think continuing to discuss the details of any of these projects uh, before we make that amendment potentially puts those projects in jeopardy according to what legal, uh, our legal department said. So um, I believe before we go further, uh, if we are to make an amendment to continue this process, it seems to me the most prudent way uh, to have an open discussion with the public uh, and to modify this process without putting this entire process in jeopardy, which I fear could just delay this further if we have to issue a new RFP for these. So I just wanted to say that, and um, I know Jennifer just stepped out, but 
um, when she gets back, if like you know, if we can get her legal opinion on on that in terms of the discussion here, uh, that would be helpful. Um, so uh, I'll wait for Jennifer to, to get back and give us her her thoughts um, on that because I feel like if we prolong this discussion without making that amendment, then then perhaps we're putting this process in jeopardy. Thank you, yes. Councillor Vasquez. Ms. Vega Brown, there, we need your legal guidance. I'm sorry, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and um, Council, what was the question? Councillor Vasquez, you want to repeat that? Uh, yes, um, uh, Attorney Vega Brown. Uh, continuing to discuss the details of these projects without making an amendment, if we are not to vote on these today, uh, I feel like puts the RFP process in jeopardy um, before we make the amendment to go ahead and discuss these openly in a future work session. And so my question is, uh, do we need to do that if that is our intention uh, and not continue discussion about individual projects uh, to move forward in a way that uh, keeps in place the, the and honors the RFP process that we have currently? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Councillor Vasquez, I agree that we should not discuss, um, it would be a violation of our own policy if we discuss anything regarding an open RFP. In order to be compliant with our own policy, it, I would rec highly recommend that we table if you would like to review that process to um, bring, a, bring forth another resolution that amends that process. Any kind of open discussion regarding the requirements or any detail of any of the um, entities that submitted could violate our process. Thank you, Attorney Vega Brown. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And I uh, secondly also just want to thank staff uh, because I know that this is a hard uh, this is a hard process to undertake with this amount of federal money potentially uh, impacting our communities in different ways with nonprofits that I know provide valuable services to our communities. Uh, this is a highly competitive uh, grant uh, undertaking grant process and. Uh, our local nonprofits uh, don't get to see these types of applications every day to serve and do the good things in their communities that uh, that they already do. And so I know how important this is, especially to our community leaders and nonprofit leaders. And so uh, I, I don't want to jeopardize, jeopardize that, that process in any way. Although I, I wholeheartedly agree also with Councilor Brinkelman that there's some terrific projects on here, um, especially some that have, have obviously ranked high for a reason. Uh, I just want to make sure we're, we, we don't later come back and. And, and find out that we've broken our own rules and have to uh, start this process all over again. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Councillor Vasquez. Mayor? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So basically, and I appreciate your comments, uh, Jennifer. So what I'm thinking uh, if, with Council's concurrence is if we have it, say, next Monday from one to whatever, you know, from our regular time, we invite all the applicants. They have a few minutes to talk, three minutes each talk about what they have to offer. We'll have their packet in front of us. If there are some that don't qualify, just like staff said, uh, they, they'll explain why they don't qualify. And then we have to you know, remove them. And then we just start whittling down the, the, the applicants. And then we come to a uh, conclusion. And you know, just like everything else, we, if, if we we'll try to make it work with, within the amount of money that we have, and what we think is serves the public the best. But it's fair, it's open, transparent, and uh, at least the applicants have a chance to understand what council's thinking and, and why or why not they were or were not chosen. Thank you, Mayor. I think um, Ms. Gallagher has some additional comments that she would like to make. Mayor, City Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Lynn Gallagher, Director for the Quality of Life Department for the Record, and a member of the um, executive committee that participated in the review. This is an active procurement process, and therefore it is confidential, and there are redress, and there are opportunities for applicants to gather information as soon as the process completes itself. Um, I would like to state, as a member of the committee, that we followed the letter and spirit of the, the uh, resolution and the requirements that council put upon us. It was a very delineated process. The, um, the 2 CFR 200 was really specific in nature in what it was looking for. And the members of the committee spent a lot of time, energy, and with good intention meeting with the, the applicants in an open forum. 
there was opportunity to be heard on multiple levels. And I would just like to say that it is an active procurement and we did follow it to the letter and spirit of your recommendation. And therefore, the, the nine people that moved forward, moved forward with the intention that they met the requirements of those most impacted by COVID. We only had $10 million to work with and more than $26 million applied. We would love to have granted it to everybody, but some just didn't meet that requirement that is really handed down from the federal government. And those that did, did a really good job. All of them did a really good job. And they had an opportunity to be heard and to hear from us as the panelists. And I think that it was open, it was transparent. Those that have concerns and questions about the process have legal recourse and the ability to hear about that once procurement concludes lawfully. And, and I would just like the, the council to recognize that those nine members have presented really great projects that will have imminent impact if the contracts are able to move forward. Starting over again is starting over again. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may. Thank you, Lynn. Yes, Mayor. So, and thank you for that, Lynn. And, and, and for all we know, it could be the same nine. But I think what I'm hearing from our legal, from, from Jennifer, is that in order to openly discuss this and the reasons for or not, or not uh, qualifying, is if we were to table this, and we have this next week, we, have, we run through the same process, and we'll have staff there, and you guys will, can share with us your concerns at that forum and tell us why you think this should move forward, why it shouldn't. <clears throat> but now it, it, it's involving the council and, and the public and, and those they can speak and they can say, no, I, okay, no, I don't believe that's right, or yes, I believe, you know, okay, that's the case. And it's very possible that the, that the nine that the staff has chosen could be the very nine that we decide to move on, but at least, uh, we, we delay it by one week, and we we allow everyone to at least have their say because I, I think right now they haven't been told, and I, and I understand why, but they haven't been told why they don't qualify, and if, and they don't have a chance to, to ask more questions. I guess is really the whole thing, and, and that's all I'm trying to get at. Thank you, Mayor. Leanne, do you have something to add? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor and Council, I just want to uh, remind and ask our attorney to help me with this, but this is an open procurement, so we're actually not able to talk about it until we actually have a signed contract by either all nine or the top five. My recommendation is that if at the next work session you do want to discuss them, even by tabling this resolution, you still have an open procurement. We cannot discuss anything. So we need to either, and I'm gonna ask attorney uh, Jennifer Vega Brown to help me, but we have to either deny or table this resolution and start over with this process. Um, but it's an open procurement. So we're, I don't believe that you can even discuss this during the next work session. And I'll ask Jennifer to clarify that for me. Mayor Pro Tem and City Council, thank you. This is Jennifer Vega Brown, your city attorney. Um, you can you can table it and discuss and redo the process. You cannot discuss the details of the applicants or their qualifications because it is an open procurement. But you can redo the process because that was um, established and passed by resolution. So if you would like to make changes to that, then you can do that. Madam Chair, um, can yes, I ask Mayor. Jennifer a quick question? So Jennifer, are you saying that if we did table it and if that new process means now council now basically acts as the committee, is that what you're referring to? Is it what we can do that? I'm sorry, Mayor, can you, can you repeat that? I didn't hear you. Oh, so, so basically what if, if we were to table this and then, like you said, start with a new process, well, the process really would be instead of having uh, staff do the, um, be the committee, it would be the council be the committee with advice of staff. Isn't that a new process and would that still be eligible? 
Um, Mayor and Council, I think I hear you asking if you can make the City Council the committee? Correct. Yes. It is a violation of the procurement code to allow um, any, the only individual, according to the procurement code, um, that can speak to the um, entity that has submitted a, a response to an RFP is the purchasing manager or the designee um, from the city manager. So any um, communication with other staff or uh, um, especially elected officials would violate our own code. Oh, okay, if, if I may, Madam Chair, but that's as a procurement, that's as a uh, RFP. What if we choose not to do an RFP and we just, we just um, discuss these because this is, uh, it's not like this is annual funding. I, I understand that. I mean, this is once in a lifetime funding. We probably hopefully never see it again. And, and it's, a, it's, it's almost like when we have an ad hoc committee, you know, we have our standing committees and then we have an ad hoc committee that we just have for one purpose and then it goes away. I, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding why we can't do that with this money. Mayor and Council, um, I think if I understand correctly, it, it was the determination of the City Council to allocate this funds through the RFP process. I would have to I, I would have to look at the CFR to see if that is required. I don't know if that's required. I don't know what kind of selection process. You could you could certainly an, create another type of selection process. I I think as long as it's in compliance with the CFR, I would have to double check that and I would have to defer to Natalie on that. But the the RFP process was something that was determined by City Council. No, I got you, and Madam Chair, and I, I understand, Jennifer, but we're not talking about RP. and I, I know what you're saying, I know that's how it is right now, but if we were to basically cancel it and then start the process different with council, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a shot in the dark here that, the, that all the city councils and county commissions throughout the United States are not holding it the way we are doing it. I think they're probably, it's a one-time deal. They're probably doing, some of them, half of them, maybe doing it themselves. Maybe they're having staff do it. I think it's a, it's a very different way of, of conducting business. That's just my opinion. So Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor and Council, this is Leanne to Michigan. Uh, we do have compliance and reporting guidelines that are put down by the U.S. Treasury that we have to abide by for this uh, ARPA funding. We need to go through those, and I mean, we've gone through and we've read this over and over and over, but maybe what we might do is get with um, our city attorney and come with sort of a cheat sheet on what our, those compliances are. From what I'm hearing from the mayor and from council, you have adopted a resolution that outlines a specific RFP process and that's what we're, we're abiding by is that resolution that was passed back in July, August, back in August. So, and I'm gonna ask our city attorney to help me. My understanding is we would have to rescind or, yeah, rescind that particular resolution. And then if council, if it allows it through the guidelines, which it could, but if it, if it allows it through these guidelines, then we would have to write another resolution to put out what those guidelines are for council to be able to do that process. Am I correct in stating that? Ms. Brown, Ms. Vega Brown? Uh, Mayor and council, yes, you would have to cancel the RFP. I'm trying to look through the procurement code now to um, determine how that cancellation yeah. would occur, but the RFP would have to be canceled. Could yeah, you, would it have to be canceled for this on. purpose? Point of order, please. Sorry. Do you have something to say, Councilor Flores? Thank you, but I believe his light was on Well, first. and Councilor Vasquez still has the floor. Oh, I'm so sorry, Councilor. That's okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. You know, one suggestion I might make here um, that might give us some time to think about this process is uh, if we table this resolution to our next regular city council meeting and take the work session to actually examine the RFP process more in depth uh, to make a determination at our meeting on the 20th of whether we want to vote on this particular resolution or whether we want to restart the process over again, 
I think that might be a wise course of action um, in terms of uh, not having to dis decide on this now. So if we table this particular resolution until the 20th and take next work session, not to discuss the particulars of the RFP or of the applicants of the RFP, but of the actual RFP process, the qualifications, why these applicants were chosen under the certain criteria without actually discussing or compromising the RFP process, that gives us a better idea on the 20th if we want to restart the process or if we want to vote on this resolution as is. That would be my suggestion based on where we're at. And I'd look to Jennifer to see if that's a viable option. Thank you, Councillor Vasquez. I know I see Jennifer and Mr. Peely's um, lights on. I, I do have some comments and some points of clarification before we move forward, and I haven't had an opportunity to speak, so I'd like to do that. Um, I do wanna say how um, grateful I am to staff. I know this isn't an easy feat. Um, I, I think it's you're hearing this, you're feeling like we did all this work and is it for nothing, and I don't want you to, to feel like that. But I do want you to know that I received numerous concerns and complaints about the process, about decisions that were made in regards to um, maybe agencies that asked for a certain amount of money and you decreased it by a certain amount without having conversations or questions asked specifically at, during that executive um, or the SAC committee um, conference, if you will, um, down to uh, other things. So question that I have in terms of clarification, Ms. Green, is um, related to those entities that got denied prior to moving, I guess, to the next process. Who denied them? Is it you, the three of you, um, Amy, Natalie, and Jonathan? Um, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, that would be correct. It was a decision between the non-scoring eligibility review committee. So it was uh, through committee, Amy, myself, and Jonathan that went through those and made those decisions. Now, as, was there as, a specific matrix that you used and were they fa everybody familiar and it said in the rules that this was going to happen, that there was a matrix or a rubrics with the scoring? So there wasn't, uh, it, it's not a score, it was a yes or no, it was eligible under the statutory uh, requirement with ARPA. Okay. And it is step two of your adopted evaluation process. And okay. uh, there was a number of factors, but the primary factor was the eligibility and it's, uh, again, I'll go back to that screen. Uh, on whether it, uh, met the statutory intent of uh, the ARPA. And so in the compliance guide, uh, which was provided to the applicants, were specific eligible use categories that they had to select, and then they also had to describe their projects. Uh, so those that us, and, oh, I can go, I have those slides. So these, uh, were provided to all the applicants. Now they could have selected them, but again, there was some that were, it was just tangential to the, I mean, you, you would have to work really hard to make that case. Um, but again, all of these were shared with the applicants. It was a part of the RFP. Uh, a lot of the focus was uh, on uh, services and programming. That's what it was supposed to be. Direct services and direct programming for disproportionately impacted communities and addressing negative economic impacts. Um, without discussing specifics, uh, that, that's all I'll say for now. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, I will be discussing. Um, again, some of these you'll notice uh, there's asterisks and little things. Uh, when council considers, uh, they do have to uh, identify how these selected projects are, are, are using evidence-based practices. Um, there's some other factors that they have to consider. Um, and so staff, uh, again, went through those, so. Thank you, Natalie, I appreciate that. I, I know you're struggling to give. Yes. You, I well, know you want to give more information and yes. I really appreciate it and, and I don't want us to. to and um, I will tell you that uh, we are not, uh, I, I read the same criticisms you guys got. I went back and I looked at the, guy, the, the compliance guide again. I reread 200, I reread the interim rule. 
staff feels confident in their decision making that the projects that were not selected were not selected for very specific reasons. And it was not arbitrary, it was not manipulative, it was not capricious, it was not opaque, obscure, all the other you know, uh, descriptors that were used today and in their emails. All right, I'll be quiet. Thank, thank you, Ms. Green, I, I appreciate that. My other concern is, is that there were some um, projects that were um, possibly shovel ready or the concept maybe was um, referred to it being shovel ready but still needing to possibly um, qualify through Mortgage Finance Authority, the Telshare Fund, those things, and I, I didn't understand the process by which people in the committee approved that moving moving forward. So uh, can you help describe that and mitigate some of my concern around that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Bencomo, without understanding which specific, um, just looking through these, uh, I can tell you that only one was contingent on another source of funding, but it was a non-competitive source of funding. So the committee felt comfortable making the recommendation that it was not uh, uh, awarding funding that for a project that wasn't gonna happen. Okay, okay. Now what about those programs that came, that said we need this amount of money to provide this amount of service, and you all said we're only gonna give you this partial partial, um, a partial amount. What kind of conversation was held, had with them in relation to, or does that come later? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, um, the committee's recommendation was just that, a recommendation to council. So okay. council has the ability to change those numbers within the allocated budget. Um, the two in question are, are seven and eight that had their uh, respective amounts reduced. Um, again, that was part of the public process. They discussed it very similarly. In fact, they sat on the dais and acted almost like a council, so they discussed their concerns very openly. And again, some of that will be dictated by the, the CFRs. So until we do that initial pre-risk and contract negotiation, um, it's very likely that those costs are legitimate costs. We're not saying they're legitimate costs, but we need to verify if they're direct costs or if they're indirect costs. And if they're indirect costs, then they're capped at a 10% rate. If they're direct costs, then the agency will have to demonstrate that. And they'll also have to demonstrate that those costs are costs borne across all of their grant and funding sources. So you can't bill ARPA um, Again, I'll use the copier. You can't bill ARPA for the copier if you don't bill your other grants for the copier or you don't bill yourself for the copier because the CFRs talk very specifically that costs should be treated the same whether it's a federal award or a non-federal award. And I understand that there's some nuance to the federal regulations that you can't just put in an RFP because there's a million different uh, scenarios, mm -hmm. right? You can't plan for everything. I will emphasize that I discussed the two CFRs, uh, the Uniform Administrative uh, Requirements with the nonprofits. It's the very first thing on the RFP in the required assurances. In fact, it's bolded, it's underlined. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, within the, the pre-proposal, again, that was the top item that I asked nonprofits to consider when they are applying for this funds. Because it is federal funding, there are federal regulations that we have to comply that aren't flexible. And it would be disingenuous of them to say that they didn't understand what was in this book because it was shared with them. Um, in the pre-proposal, I also shared that it's the airplane in the sky, right? This compliance reporting has been updated four times since July. A and it talks about what's changed. So uh, it, the federal government is very much building the airplane in the sky and that is the example I, I use with them and I'm using with this council. Everything is changing. It changes very rapidly. The best we can do is make sure that they are eligible, spelled out criteria, that it's eligible in the uses as outlined by the compliance guide. I will say there's there's a potential for additional changes. I know that there's uh, 
uh, bills in both the Senate and the House that'll allow the council to use more funding for infrastructure uh, or to use it for uh, CDBG eligible uses. So they're gonna try and incorporate some additional regulations that makes it more flexible for uh, local governments to use. Thank you, Natalie, I appreciate that. Okay, Councillor Vasquez. Thank you, uh, Councillor, Mayor Pro Tem Gandara. Uh, I'm just gonna come back to, to the idea of, of perhaps, especially if we can get a legal opinion during our work session um, next Monday about even the discussions we've had today and that compromising the RFP process, I think we need to make sure that we are in good legal standing to make a decision to move forward. Uh, on voting for the resolution as it is or starting a new process. It sounds like those are our two options. And even if we decide, if we, I fear if we vote on this today without having the proper information that we are not compromised, that haven't already compromised the RFP process that, that we may end up in a spot we don't wanna be in. And so I would suggest that, again that we perhaps take the work session to talk about bringing this resolution uh, when we bring this resolution back, if we table it until the 20th, uh, that we vote on it then, um, according to all the great work that staff has done and, uh, and understand the process as a city council to make sure every applicant had a fair and equal chance to apply for these funds, or whether, um, as the mayor and others have suggested, that we, that we may need to look at another way of awarding these funds. I think we can discuss that without talking about the actual applicants, um, but talking about the process. That, that sounds like the right thing to do, but um, and happy to make make that amendment to table this until the twentieth, if other members of the council agree. Thank you, Mayor Prince. Thank you, Councillor Vasquez. I want to hold off on that it, it, just to give Councillor Sork an opportunity to voice his opinion and ask any questions. Councillor Sork. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, that's an interesting discussion you we're having today, aren't we? Um, Appreciate all the work, hard work you all do, of course. Um, I'm not opposed to having a work session anytime. You know, I'll take one tomorrow even. Uh, no, I, I, um, but I wanna make sure we can, we can have one on this topic. If uh, the att city attorney says that we need a resolution in order to discuss this RP process, then that means a whole nother regular meeting just to put out the resolution, doesn't it? Am I not wrong? So I don't see the purpose of the, the work no. session at all. One moment. Um, are you asking for clarification from Jennifer? Of course, Sorry. yes. I think I heard her pretty well, though. Um, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. Uh, the reason that you would table it and bring it back is to discuss the process. If you wanted to change the process as it as it now is, then you would, you could have a work session to discuss that process and what that process will be. It is not to discuss the, the details of, of an RFP. The procurement code allows for um, cancellation of an RFP if it's in the best interest of the city in section 24-139. Um, there is also an appeals process, which is contained in 24231. After the RFP is awarded, there is an appeals process that is contained in our procurement code. In addition to that, I think it's important that everybody review the um, section 24-31, which is direct contact. During the inactive um, RFP, an applicant is, is prohibited from having any direct contact with city staff or elected officials during while that is open. So that, that's why we have to prohibit that type of open meeting. The open meeting would be to discuss a, a change in process. Okay, why can't we do that just now? Be, um, Mayor and City Council, that's not on the agenda. What's on the agenda uh, today okay. is to accept the um, priorities. All Agreed. right. Correct, yeah. Well, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that You're a lot. Welcome. Um, so, yeah, um, um, we can have a work session then next week for, for, for the prep purpose, fine, it's fine with me. Thank you, Ma Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Councilor Stark. So I have three things I wanna say. One, before Mr. Peely, I'm sorry. Um, I know the public, there are folks here that would like to speak their mind here at this particular agenda item and I'd like to do that. Are you recommending that we move forward and be able to do that, Jennifer? Secondly, um, 
Um, I understand that Viola did a, uh, Ms. Peralta did a review of the process and she has some information to share with us or I thought she'd be ready to share. Are you recommending that that happen today as well? Uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council, I, the, as long as the public comment is um, centered around the uh, specific agenda item, which is the nine um, recommendations that have been listed on the agenda. Um, I'll defer to Ms. Berea. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilor, um, Madam Chair. The internal audit has been in the process of conducting a compliance review of the selection process, specifically limited to the eligibility determination. That process has not been completed or the review has not been completed as of this meeting. And so I would like to hold back any comment until we've completed the entire process for council. What is your timeline, Ms. Padilla? Um, we can have it done by next week. Um, normally a, a, a mag an audit of this magnitude takes us anywhere from three plus months. We've had just a couple of weeks. So in order to do our due diligence and have a complete review of the process, I'm asking for at least one more week, if not two. Thank you, Ms. Padilla. So Jennifer, to clarify, if we ask for public comment, it has to be specific to one through nine, not the um, other three that have been omitted from the process. Um, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council, yes, it would be limited to the agenda item. Okay. Okay. Councilor Bingomo. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, and um, thank you, Ms. Pera. Um Jennifer or whoever, is there room in the procurement um, for the possible change to be that the committee can discuss one-to-one -one with, the, with the folks submitting the proposal about um, the decisions behind the proposal? Um, Mayor Pro Tem and um, Council, are you asking if the I'm sorry, I'm just trying to understand your question. So it, you're asking if part of the process can be that the, the specific committee that you would set up in a new process. No, not in a new process. And if I'm, I guess I'm, I'm asking if, if the change could be to the resolution, the amendment to the resolution could be that the committee is able to meet one-to-one -one with the committee can meet with the folks propo proposing the project to discuss the decision behind that proposal. Mayor Pro Tem and Council, I will have to look very closely at the procurement code. Be because of that limited contact that is permitted from applicants, I don't know if we can make that fit into the process. Um, I see Ms. DeLeon. If I may, Mayor Pro Tem. Hi, Ms. De Leon. Thank you, Barbara De Leon for the record. So uh, my understanding of the procurement code is if, if this procurement is canceled, then certainly we can um, provide communication after the fact because we will be effectively restarting a new procurement process. But the way the code is currently written, the communication cannot take place until either a contract is signed uh, contracts are awarded under the RFP process or the RFP is canceled. So, so those are the two options that would allow uh, further communication and information to be shared with uh, proposers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Elian. Councilor Bingham. Thank you. That's, that was all my question. Okay. Okay. And Mr. Peely wanted to say something. Yeah, thank you. You have the floor. This is maybe just a thought, uh, a suggestion, and partially maybe a question. So it seems to me that, uh, you know, what's holding us from discussing, I mean, it's obvious that this is a, an open procurement, but uh, when I look at the process that has taken place, we're uh, very confident uh, that our staff has gone through the process as approved has, has done everything in accordance with what we've uh, said we would do and what the council approved. Anything else, there, there would be no changes if we were to come back to their recommendation. Um, there may be disagreement in how things were interpreted, but as far as the way 
our committee went through, the process was followed. And so I, I just want to make that point. But the, the question and maybe suggestion here is that I, uh, it sounds to me that an approval, a denial, you know, just the, the options that you have, amendment, taking the top five, as, as Councilor Brancomo mentioned, and then voting on any of those things uh, closes that process. Uh, our staff has done their, their process. Uh, you've made a decision on it, yes, no, or top five, whatever you want to do. And then it opens. So after that, uh, takes the committee, the committee has done their job, but then it opens up afterwards uh, to be able to, to have discussion. And, uh, but I, I don't think any more discussion will change the committee's uh, recommendation. Uh, it may change, you may have better recommendations on, on your end. I mean, you might may have different decisions on your end, but what will be coming back from the committee would, would not be anything different if we, if we came back for a work session. And so a uh, suggestion would be take action, either deny it, approve it, or, you know, any one of the, those, those recommendations you can choose to award. Again, the question comes, you know, my thought is that that, that does, maybe I'm looking to, to both finance and legal, that once that happens, technically our, it's now closed, right? Is that correct? Mayor Pro Tem and City Council, the RFP process isn't closed until the contract is awarded. That is why after the contract is awarded, there is a, there is a, bid, in, a bid protest period of time. I, I believe it's 15 days. So once the contract is awarded, there could be an appeal to that decision and that is um, allowable within 15 days. Okay. And, and then Jennifer, if they deny it, it's closed, closed. right? Then we don't have, if, right, correct, the, the process is, is done. Mayor, I, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council, if the contract isn't awarded, then that would close the process because you would have failed to um, award the contract or you can, because the code allows it, you can cancel the RFP altogether before going through the, the action of having to develop a contract, look, you know, staff has to develop the contract there has to be some negotiation with the contract and then it has to come to council. So if that's the intention is to just not award a contract, then a suggestion would be to just cancel the RFP. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Mr. Peely. Councillor Vasquez. Thank Councilor you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I appreciate uh, Manager Peely's suggestion, uh, but I will say that one of council's jobs uh, is to allocate funds as they see fit, whether through a committee or whether through the budgetary process. And so uh, council having a full understanding of how staff did their job, as you mentioned, right, that they followed the rules. I, I think my suggestion is that we take that next work session to have that security before we vote on this to say council, to say the process was followed, here's how it was followed. Here's the confidence that we have in voting for this because this is $10 million being distributed to our community partners. This is not a small chunk of change and so, uh, my suggestion, again, is, is to make sure that uh, the votes that we take as counselors to allocate this money into the community uh, is done with due diligence. And what I'm hearing is that there's some questions and there's some assurance that our community partners need uh, that council voted the way that they did for uh, a specific reason that followed the federal procurement rules uh, and is confident that our staff did their job. I'm not saying that they didn't, but I think that's part of our job is to have that proof to our community that, that we're, we're making the right decision. So while I appreciate the information that you have, Manager Peely, that may not be information that the, the council has fully in terms of how staff came to that decision. I think it's, it's $10 million. I think it's important yeah. for, for our community to know that we took a process that's transparent. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, Councillor. I'm just trying to figure out what information you would need further than what was being, pre than what we presented. So. We outlined the process that we went through as a committee. We went through the, the methodology. Uh, we, we said those that were deemed ineligible were based on an ARPA statute uh, guidelines, and that was interpreted by, by a three-party committee. And so maybe, maybe direction as to what you would need from staff to show how we went through that process. But also remember that we, we are limited to what we could say too, so because it's still open procurement. And so I'm trying to figure out how to balance 
give you as much information you need at the same time not violate uh, the procurement process. And it seems to me the only way to do that is to try to close it or change the whole process, which actually closes it anyway. I, I thank you, Manager Peel. I appreciate that. And I think uh, it, part, of, part of what I'm thinking is we have some very qualified and, and very terrific applicants here who, who were deemed ineligible, uh, who have applied for grants and probably have gotten million dollar grants from uh, the government or other agencies. And so that black, bold, underlined text that disqualified certain applicants, uh, I would like to know what that black, under bold text was because I have the confidence that some organizations here uh, have the capacity and the organizational uh, knowledge and institutional knowledge of how these programs work that I would like to know what, what those, so without talking about the applicants, talking about the process. Uh, and, and again, this is, I, I believe that staff did their job, but when we have concerns from folks in our community that, that that have brought these, you know, brought these legitimate concerns forward. Um, I, I think we owe it to them to be able to review that process as a city council before taking a vote. That's just my opinion. Now, I'll just say I don't have any problem with the nine items that are on this list at all. I just think I would like to have that clarity and that certainty for our applicants uh, that I think would bring confidence in what we're doing here as a council with this large amount of money. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilor Vasquez, <laughs> Councilor Sword. Councilor Bencomo and Mayor, I think I hear. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mayor Bertam. Uh, I'll just say this is that uh, I'm, I'm willing to approve this resolution, all or, or part of it, um, either way. Um, and so if the rest of the council wants to go that way, I, I, I'm good with that. Or even tabling it to the next meeting too. Thank you, Mayor Bertam. Thank you, Councillor Soar. Councillor Bincomo. Thank you, Mayor Pertem. I, I agree with Councillor Vasquez, actually. I think that that's critical, even if at the end of the day, or the year, I should say, the nine projects remain, I think there's just, there has to be a way to figure out how to answer some of these questions, right, without um, jeopardizing the process. I did, though, want to ask, um, I think it, there, w I think there has been some miscommunication um, because today, what I expected was to learn about the nine projects. So, you know, I think we're also being asked to vote on this resolution, nine projects, which I very highly support. Um, but I was expecting today to hear details, and I think the public wants to hear details. And I would love the experts who propose this to talk about this. And one reason is to. Um, provide a counter narrative to some of the concerns that exist about some of these projects, right? And so um, at what point does this board, this council who is deciding on allocating these funds get to hear the details? Because it's, it doesn't make sense that we get to hear the details once it's closed. And thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Green. Oh, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Bencomo, all of the projects, if, if again, you're just, uh, the option is to approve the funding recommendations by the committee. Each of those individual projects would come back within the next month or two, depending on how long it takes to get those contracts. And they'd have performance-based contracts, which would tell you uh, the description, the scope of the project, the exact program measures and objectives that we're trying to achieve. And, and it would be, uh, an individual resolution per contract award. Okay, and at that point, thank you, Natalie, and at that point, it, is there still, for example, because it, there's still some funding that has not been allocated, could at that point we say, oh, this, the rest of this funds could be allocated to any particular project? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Brinko, I defer to budget. Um, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilor Bencomo, we might be able to do a sole source after that with available funds. That might be one option that we can look into as a sole source. 
with with the leftover funds so there is a there is that availability there is that room there could be we need to look into the csr and also into the arpa guidelines to make sure that that's appropriate and i just don't know that information in front of me but there i mean in our own procurement we do have the option of the sole source okay. so it just has to meet all of the requirements that are in the the procurement code okay 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 thank you and then i just want to reiterate though right that um there's some frustrations here and that there's a procurement code for a reason <laughs> right that there's a, a strict procurement code for a very good reason um but i do um i just i do want to respect that our community is feeling like they're there's still not enough information. Um, even if, we, to me, changing the entire process does not seem feasible. It is $10 million that is supposed to be for economic relief, sitting on $10 million for another six months while our community, members of our community are struggling, I don't think is the right way to go. Um, but again, I do wanna respect the fact that there are community members that still need more information um, and, um, I just don't think starting over is the right way to go. Thank you, Councilor Bencomo. Mayor? Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Can you guys hear me? Hold on a second. Yes, we can hear you. Let me take Is that, is that any better? A little bit? Mayor, are you there? Yeah, can you, I'm, I'm here, you can't hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. So. <clears throat> I think herein lies the problem. When we did this, and I too was kind of like Councilman Como, because I thought we were going to hear, get a chance to hear these and, and, and support or not support, right? But we're, and of course I'll take full responsibility for this, but we're, if we could go back in time, it would have been nice to say, if we go through the regular RFP process like the city has done for everything else we do, council can't have any input as to which projects are chosen. If they'd said, if we had then said, okay, maybe we're gonna make the process open for council to be the selection committee with advice of staff, you know, because we need their professional uh, information that they can provide. And then we now get a chance to interview and find out from these various uh, non-governmental organizations that, that wish to, to apply for this money. I think that's the way to go. And if it means us having to not accept this RFP and then go and change the, the, the process so that we become the, the committee. And, and I, I'm reminded, and, it, and if you all recall, about two months ago, there was an applicant who wanted to get on the utilities board, but for whatever reason, wasn't allowed. And, and you all allowed us to table it. We then put this applicant in there. It went through the process, and lo and behold, the process stayed the same. And I think but, but what we did is we showed that applicant that we valued what they had to say, that, and we, we, if there was a situation where it wasn't correct, we at least redid it. And as it turned out, the, the first choice was the same as, the, as the, when, when it came back the second time. And so I'm not saying that we're gonna change everything. I think we're gonna keep basically, the, the, obviously the same people are gonna wanna apply, but instead of the, the, the um, Selection Advisory Committee being staff, it's gonna be city council. And, and, and with advice of staff to provide us their concerns. And they're gonna say, wait a minute, you can't do this because this doesn't, we, in our opinion, this doesn't um, um, match or con concur with what the federal guidelines are. Okay, then, then we, we remove it. But at least it's an open, and transparent process. And, and the public, the media, everybody can hear why it was chosen or not chosen. That, that's just what I'm thinking. And, 
And, and I don't really think it's going to take six months. I think it's probably going to slow us down a few weeks, maybe three or four weeks. But it's better to be to err on that side than to to not move. I mean, to and then to do something that may be flawed, possibly, at least in the court of public opinion. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am going. I think in the spirit of. <laughs> of valuing the public and um, those um, folks that that want to um, say something, it's public comment. So I'll start on my left in regards to this specific agenda item. This specific agenda item. Please come front forward, please. Yes, sir. Gracias. This has been a very interesting meeting, but I'm not surprised. Please. please oh, my um, name is Robert. Robert is one T. Butler. That's not three T's, it's one. I'm not going to Appleton. He's your man, Well, I'd be very humble with merit. To be more to the point is that I'm not Welch, I'm not Dutch. So be careful. I see a lot of pictures of people I'm finding. That's not good. That sounds like NSA. Yes, NSA. You can't go wrong with the NSA. They're bagging Bogey Bear, even though he's white at midnight. Right, that's all I have to say. I'm not thrilled with billboards coming from Montana. That's a cheap shot. That's fake, fake, fake. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bullard. Yeah. Mr. Jeffords. My name is Vince Jeffers, and I would like for you guys to let people do their jobs. You, you do the same thing with law enforcement. You, you're overmanaging and not letting people do what they're hired to do. They're the experts. You want to put yourselves on the panel now. You're not necessarily an expert on, in contract law or how to award contracts. They get everything that you ask them in the process that you gave them to do. The process that you said, this is the process we want you to follow. Now, they have federal requirements. These are federal funds. They're awarding contract using the lines of appropriation that are federal funds. And there are things that have to be followed. They said to you, some of these people are not, or some of these organizations are not eligible. They didn't meet the requirements. They didn't have everything that, you know, I dotted, T crossed. That's just the way it is. And the mayor says, well, why don't we just table it or, you don't know if it's the same people that's gonna apply or more people, we don't know that. The right thing to do, I mean, if you wanted to amend this and say, all right, we'll take 10% off the top of these nine, and then turn around and say, um, whatever's left, you can appeal. The people who weren't awarded funds, you can appeal it. Even the people who were awarded funds, if you want more, you can still appeal. Use that process. You guys constantly go around things and say, well, we're the deciders. We, we don't need a process. We'll do it. We're the leaders who are ineffective leaders, not trusting our people to do their jobs. I'm saying, please, I like Doniana Arts Council. I like Crucif Creators. I, it would be nice that they have funds, but you know what? They didn't get, they didn't make the cut. That's just the way it goes. Fill out the appeals process. Three of the top five are unhealthy relationships involving fraud with the city. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's gonna come around. Those three are wrong. You guys are in business with bad people. Thank you, Mr. Jeffers. Anybody else? Please make it to the front, please, if you have something to say.
Leo Wyeser-Guy, Executive Director of Cruises Creatives. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors, City Manager, City Staff, thank you for your time today. I am also here on behalf of Candice Moreno of Mesilla Valley Habitat of Humanity. Leah, one moment, please. I'm sorry for interrupting. Okay, um, I was just notified by our attorney, if you are an applicant that p submitted a proposal and at any time council decides to change this criteria, you would be um, deemed ineligible if you have, if you state anything further. Uh, to clarify, is that stating based off of particulars of my own application or questions based off of the process in and of itself? All of it, Leah, is my understanding. Mayor Pro Tem and um, council members, in section 24-31 direct contact reads, direct contact with city elected officials or city staff other than the purchasing manager during the bid proposal process will render the bid proposal as non-compliant and no further consideration will be given to the bid proposal. Uh, All right, on you. behalf of the other nonprofits that were deemed ineligible, I will still speak because that is the right thing to do here. Looking at the actual application process, it was not fair or transparent, and it did not reference the federal guidelines. And when we were asked to say which part of our guidelines were we not meeting our eligibility for, we were never able to get a response back for that. Knowing that these funds are so, they're, they're meant to fix our pandemic, right? Knowing that almost 50% of our nonprofits couldn't even get to the scoring matrix is ridiculous. These are nonprofits that they're daily lives, right? Like they live their lives and careers to do this type of work and to not even be allowed at the table to see if they can be at the scoring matrix, to say you're ineligible with no reason whatsoever is not only disheartening, but disgraceful. And I am personally here to just ask that the idea of Mayor Maya Gashima and Councillor Vasquez of spending one session to look at the process to find out what that eligibility requirement was, where is their checklist, how did they decide who was ineligible or not is reviewed. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Madam Chair. Yes, Mayor. I just want to say, what, what I, in my opinion, what Jennifer is saying is correct. However, if we, if we cancel this RFP, it starts a whole new process. And so um, the lady who just spoke, and I'm sorry, I forgot her name, um, can speak. You know what I'm saying? That, that's what, what, what staff is trying to say is under this current process, we've got to, uh, either cancel it or anyone who talks basically is out. But if we start a new process, then it starts the whole clock all over again. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there's one more person that would like to speak in regards to public comment. Thank you. Uh, Lori Martinez with Engage New Mexico again. Um, first of all, I just want to say, I know this is hard because on the one hand, the city is to be commended for putting out an RFP process for your ARPA funds that is far more than a lot of other municipalities are doing. And so this is a hard process all the way around. And I know that my concerns are not necessarily that anyone hasn't done their job. And frankly, it doesn't matter to me whether the review committee is the city council or the city staff. I do think like Councilor Ben Como said, it should be diverse and representative of our community. But I can um, point to you my specific concern. If we can go to, I believe these are uh, Ms. Green's slides. If we can go back to the slide where it brings up the review committee members. Thank you. This is the nature of my concern. 
when the city put out the RFP process, it was very clear the criteria that we would all be evaluated by. And that was the, A, you have to be a nonprofit, et cetera, you have to be meeting these areas the city is looking to focus on with reference to how ARPA funds need to be spent. There was also a scoring matrix. And so, you know, what, and that's in here too, um, on one of the slides. What are you, are you following in those areas? Here's how you're scored. But the problem is, None of us knew that there was gonna be a pre-screening committee of these three members ahead of time. It's not unusual to have a pre-screen committee just to make sure that nonprofits are eligible. I serve on a grant-making committee for a foundation, I understand that. So it's not unusual to make sure that those who submitted applications are actually eligible to submit the application. However, there was no matrix as there was with the review committee. So there was no scoring matrix for us to know by what criteria those three people were using to determine whether or not the applications went forward. Furthermore, was it, were the three of them voting? Was it just one of them who had the power to make the decision about whether or not an application moved forward? So there was no clarity as there was in the public RFP that went out. The matrix was there, it was clear. But this other step in the process that was completely not clear wasn't in the RFP. And so for me, having that criteria, what, what were they using to determine whether or not these proposals move forward, that would answer those questions for me. Um, and I think that's the part that made the, the process unclear and seemingly not transparent and not fair to all the nonprofits who put in countless hours on these applications. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, I do want to reference you to attachment A, page Five, one, it says that non-scoring staff will review al applications for eligibility determination and full submittal requirements. The full submittal requirements and eligibility are outlined in page one with requirement one, requirement two, requirement three, requirement four, and requirement number five. Thank you, Ms. Green. Okay. Councillor Bencomo, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor um, Flores and Councillor Bencomo. Thank you, uh, Madam yes. Chair. I do have a question um, for you, Natalie. Um, I think this can of worms that we have before us at this point was um, based on Patrick's uh, comment from Cruces Creative that he didn't receive a response as to why he wasn't selected, and that was my only question. Was there a response to his question? It seems to me, if that's true, is that true? That he did not receive a response to his question as to why they were not selected? And you said no, because we're in the RFP process. Wouldn't it have, wouldn't it have been, would, I think, prudent for the city to advise people that um, we're, just to advise them that we are in the recruitment or in the RFP process, and it has not been uh, completed. Um, because if you're telling them already that they didn't, um, that they didn't uh, 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 meet the requirements, but on the other hand, we're done, which is it? Are we done or are we still in the middle of this uh, procurement process? Um, so there has to be some kind of notice. I think um, it, it almost seems uh, rude, and I don't mean it personally, but just as a practice as a city to not notify uh, someone as to why. Would it have been sufficient to say, in close, please find and read the requirements compare it to your application, uh, you might, uh, you might find the answers there. I mean, uh, that's uh, putting it simplistically, but um, it seems to me that uh, courtesy goes a long way. Um, and I think that if, uh, because there are a lot of wonderful organizations that we're aware of here in the city that does, that do a lot for our community. Um, but I think that I, I think that would have gone a long way. And if there's a legal way that you can work out with, um, with the city attorney, uh, how we can avoid that kind of um, almost indifference to those, or uh, lack of, uh, well, there was a lack of decorum or sensitivity 
uh, to people who were not selected. And then it's contradictory, does it make sense to me? I mean, I understand it, but it still doesn't make sense as to why um, we're still in the review process, the RFP process, not the review, but the RFP. That's a request for procurement and violation of codes and resolutions or whatever. And yet they've been told, we're not done with the process, but we do know you didn't make it. I mean, it doesn't make, that part is almost like a, uh, a contradiction. So I don't know how legal would work it out or you all in the city who are the experts on that, but just looking at it from where I'm sitting, it just doesn't seem fair or right and it lacks protocol. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flores. Councillor Bencomo. We have nothing, Councillor um, Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, I'm just going to keep going back to what I've been saying. I, I think we need a work session to talk about the process, and I think we need to table this until the 20th. And uh, if there's no other comments from the council, if Mayor, I would like to make uh, I'd like to make that that motion. But I will go ahead and give others an opportunity to come. Okay, if there is none, um, I'd like to make an amendment. Councillor Flores, I'm sorry. Oh, go yeah, on. Well, One moment, Councillor Vasquez. Well, thank you. You said if there's no other whatever. I disagree respectfully, Councillor Vasquez. Um, this is the process. And for, for us to get into the weeds as to how the ARPA review committee, and I know that I'm so glad that Lynn Gallagher came up and spoke and um, for, I, I hold her in high respect, not only because we're both attorneys at law, but because we, um, well, I just, I like Lynn. I, I don't mean it that way. I mean, I respect <laughs> Lynn, and I, and I don't think she would come up here and state what the process was and just say glibly and flippantly uh, that, um, and I, I, we know all of these people. Unfortunately, the, 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 uh, Every person on that ARPA review committee, in, in my estimation, are of high, you know, high, uh, are, are ethical and hold high standards. And I don't think there's anyone on that list that would be arbitrarily looking at something. We know already that the guidelines were followed. ARPA, you know, that money that was given out has to be complied, and the city is not going to in any way jeopardize the availability of that money or the distribution of that money because they didn't comply with the guidelines. That some of the, um, again, that some of our wonderful uh, nonprofits uh, were not selected, were not selected is lamentable. It's lamentable we need all those non nonprofits. I wish we had jobs for people. Maybe we should be focusing more on economic development, but that's besides the point at this point. So I just want to say that um, we, we can go from here, you know, ad infinitum, uh, discussing and going round and round, and, and we're gonna end up with the same process. We're not gonna change the code between now and next year, and we're not gonna change the process between now and next year. And I, and I, and I hold our staff in, 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 in high esteem. And to do that is shooting ourselves in the foot. I sure as hell don't want to be sitting here as long as they've been sitting there uh, working through this. I mean, I personally, uh, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, the, the kind of time that they put into it and all of this brain power and all of these talents of all these people on the ARPA review committee um, and the non-scoring eligibility review uh, committee is to really question the integrity of their work. And it's an insult in my humble opinion. No, nah, it's not a humble opinion, it's my opinion. It's my brazen opinion. And so I think we should move forward. I think we should uh, vote on this. I don't think that we need to, um, we don't need to be going so uh, far. Uh, we don't need to go any further on this. And that's, that's, and so I don't support your motion at all with all due respect, uh, Councilor Vasquez. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Ma Ma Madam Chair? Yes, Mayor. Yeah, uh, Councillor Flores, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not. We're not. I'm not looking for us to rewrite the rules. This is this is probably a once in a lifetime uh, funding, and I think just like as I as I use the example of a 
of a um, ad hoc committee, like for a, like a one-time issue, that I think to to err on the side of of, of public uh, opinion and transparency, that that we basically cancel this RFP and 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 have the process be the council, be the ones who interview the applicants and, and rank them and and assign the, the money with with advice of council or with advice of staff there because they're like like you mentioned, they they uh, if they if there are some that don't qualify, then they don't qualify. But at least it's done in a public venue. I'm not saying to rewrite it, I'm not saying it's gonna take a whole year. It, you know, it's I know there's a lot of uh, um, it, it seems like it's very convoluted, but it's not. It's, it's, it, we just cancel this one. We have our own process. We listen to, um, we pass a resolution, then we listen to the applicants in, a, in an open venue. We, we grade them, we rank them, just like we did when, uh, when we were hiring EFO. You know, we had a we had a list of 20 applicants, and we just whittled it down to one. But in this case here, we whittled it down to whatever equals the amount of money that we have uh, to reward. Just a one-time thing. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, time. Mayor. Perfect. Thank you, mm -hmm. Councillor Binkelmore. Thank you. Um, I'll address the mayor's points first because I feel like having the council be the committee is changing the rules. Uh, we've already been told that that procurement code does not allow for council to be part of that. So I, I do think it would be changing it. I don't think it's uh, fair to anybody if we start over, to be quite frank. I mean, there is there is nine excellent projects that have been recommended. And, you know, I think it's for, to Councilor Flores's point and Councilor Vasquez's point, I think it's both and. I don't think it has to be either or of those recommendations because Councilor Flores, I completely agree with you and and we have taken to consideration, right, that the community is saying there was some pieces missing. Can we dot our T's, cross, that's not right, dot our I's, cross our T's, and make sure that by the time we come back on the 20th, we feel com extra, extra confident, even though I am also confident in the process that we laid out and that the staff followed. But as I hear Ms. Martinez saying, there, there is this sticking point, right? Um, I feel like it's important that we review it in a work session next week and then come back two weeks. That's it. I don't think, um, again, starting over, I'm not in support of that. Um, but I do just want to take into consideration what our very trusted community partners are saying about um, some of the information that uh, should be made public again. And then I will just say on the other, on another note as well, um, I don't think to take full responsibility, we were not prepared for this meeting today. And I feel like, you know, we, I wanted to hear more about the projects. There was some, um, some stuff that was not clear about what, what even could be said at the podium, right? And so I just feel like um, even if it's for a reset, for two weeks from now, I think would be respectful to the community and the process. Thank you, Councillor Bencomo. Do I see the light over yonder in Councillor Abeta Stuvi's arena? My little corner over You're here. You're on. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I also agree on a bit of a two-week reset. I think if we do have a work session, one of the other items that we can have, um, our auditor also said that she could potentially have that completed um, overview of this process done by that point. And so that might give the public an additional confidence in that process if we can have those two items. Um, I also believe that it would not be um, legal or in good form for us as a council to be on an RFP in the manner that was proposed. Um, and so keeping that process I think needs to happen. But if we do have that two week reset, um, and make sure that we get some of those questions answered, get some guidelines for what we can do as council and ask. Um, and if there's any additional information that we need, I think that gives us some time to uh, reach out as well to, to city staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Abeta Stuvi. Councilor Vasquez. 
Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And uh, first, I just want to say I, I appreciate Councillor Flotus's comment and um, our difference of opinion on this. I, I think we're actually pretty close to the same thing. And I just, you know, I think it's in the it's in the best interest, I think, of the public to be able to go through this process um, and better understand uh, how this RFP was taking place, what the communication was like with uh, with potential applicants. I mean, um, something like the. Federal Register, which I believe folks pointed to, and the information that's contained there within, and having certainty that that matches up what was listed on the requirements of the application uh, that was given is, uh, to the applicant or to the public is one of the things I'd, I'd like to I'd like to know about uh, for next meeting. In addition to the audit uh, that was proposed, that we could have presented at our next meeting. Um, so with that. I would like to make a motion to postpone with the time definite to the December 20th uh, regular council meeting resolution 22-067. Uh, I'll second. Motion made to postpone to December 20th at a work session to discuss further. Second made by Councilor Abeitha Stuvey. Christine. regular meeting, not the work session. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> sorry. It would be at the December 20th regular council yeah. meeting. Yes. And not the work session. Correct? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> to be clear, this is a table motion, right? It's to postpone. To, to okay. postpone yes. um, to December 20th no, regular nice. council meeting. Yes. Okay. So this is on the motion to postpone resolution 22-067 to the December 20th city council meeting. Councillor Beta Stevie. Yes. Councillor Vasquez. Yes. Councillor Bencomo. Yes. Councillor Sorg. Yes. Councillor Flores. No. Councillor. No. <laughs> Councillor Gandara. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Okay, I'm going to be leaving now. So you guys enjoy the rest of your evening. Go Aggies. Thank you, Mayor. Go Aggies. Okay. Goodbye. Next on the agenda is um, 7.4, Council Bill number 22-011, ordinance number 2989. May I have a motion? Move to approve. Ma motion made by Councilor Sorg. Second. Second by Councilor Vasquez. Mr. Caveo, hello. Hello. Shift the four. I apologize, one sec. It's okay, um, Mr. Gaveo, take your time. It's shift F4, right? I apologize. Five. Mayor Pro Tem, Council, uh, I'm Robert Cabello, uh, Deputy City Attorney, and I'm here to uh, get, present a proposed ordinance that would update our Clean Indoor Air Act. Um, first off, it's real simple. I'll say this at the beginning. This doesn't change anything. This basically makes our law, our Clean Indoor Air Act ordinance, consistent with state law, which includes, of course, the Cannabis Regulation Act, that was passed, um, and also are the ordinance, uh, the planning, the I'm sorry, the, the zoning code changes we made in September seventh. So, the Clean Indoor Air Act, the D. Johnson Clean Indoor Air Act, that's the state uh, law. The legislature allows the city to, to, of course, create its own Clean Indoor Air, Air Act under uh, NMSA Section twenty four, sixteen twelve. It, there's only one requirement if we're going to make our own ordinance is that it's that the city ordinance has to be inclusive of all the minimum standards and provisions for smoke-free areas. That's the that's the major requirement. And why this is important is because in 2019 the New Mexico Legislature made changes to the Clean Indoor Air Act. Those changes were included, and I'll give examples. Before 2019, the legislative changes, there was always, a, of course 
retail tobacco stores and cigar bars. However, the changes from 2019 required that any store established on June 29th, uh, 2019 or after had to be in standalone buildings, meaning they could no longer be part of a strip mall. They had to be, again, standalone buildings, so this would pre prevent the, the emissions of smoke to go into other businesses. Other examples, they got rid of the private light limousine exemption. Basically, if you had a private limousine, you could smoke in that, that is no longer allowed. If uh, there was a private, uh, a small business exemption, if you were a sole proprietor, or if you had two or, I think two or fewer workers, or employees, that you could allow uh, to have smoking in the workplace, that's no longer allowed. Um, so those are the, some of the examples that they have in the 29 list, 2019 legislative changes. And of course, we, as we know now, the House Bill 2, Section 57, changed the Clean Indoor, or D. Johnson Clean Indoor Air Act to be inclusive of the cannabis and the cannabis regulation, regulatory act. So, um, to give you an idea, to give you a little history about the city's ordinance, prior to the, even the state having its own uh, statute, the city had its own ordinance. Uh, that, of course, was replaced in 20, 2007, 2007 when the state passed the D. Johnson Air, Indoor Air Act, and we made ours consistent with state law. And then again, in 2018, we made some other changes to our Indoor Air Act and that was to basically include electronic cigarette devices, it was vaping. So now the proposed ordinance is pretty simple, replaces and, just repeals and replaces the existing uh, ordinance. And then again, this is to make the smoking permitted uh, areas of that, a section of our ordinance consistent with state law. Again, those changes in 2019. And it also makes it consistent with the Cannabis Regulatory Act it also includes the changes that we did or the, the, the requirements for our ordinance 2986, which was those uh, zoning code changes that we had regarding the, the Cannabis Regulatory Act. And with that, these are, I'll open up the questions. Those are your options. Thank you, Mr. Cavell. Any questions? Seeing none. Any public comment? Thank you, Councilor Sor, for the reminder. Seeing none, Christine. This is on the motion to approve Ordinance 2989. Councilor Beta Stuvi? Yes. Councilor Vasquez? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Councilor Sorg? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. And the mayor's absent. Thank you. Okay, next is number eight, board appointments. I don't think there are any, Christine. Or yeah, is there do. one? There wasn't anything in my... Yes, it's on the cue sheet. Let me bring it to you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So sorry. I have the sheet. Yes, board appointments. Health and Human Services Advisory Committee, Miriam Chakan, District Six. Shagan, Shapen, District Six appointment. Do I need a, a motion? And, okay, all right. And I think that's it. Oh no, God, I'm really parking. doing so well. Do, downtown Parking Committee, Hugo Rios, business owner representative. Move to approve. Motion made by Councilor Sorg. Do we have a second? Second. Councilor Abeitha Stuvi, second. This is on the motion to appoint Hugo Rios to the Downtown Parking Committee. Councilor Beta Stevie? Yes. Councilor Vasquez? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Councilor Sorg? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. And the mayor is absent. Yes, Councilor um, Flores. Did we vote on Miriam uh, Chaikin? She is your appointment, so we don't need to we vote don't on need her. To. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sorg, your light is on. Do you have a question or comment? I will very soon. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, next on the agenda is notice of proposed ordinances. There will be no public discussion and the council may ask staff for clarification on the proposed ordinance. 9.1, council bill number 22-012, ordinance number 2990. 
I have a question. Yes, Councillor Soar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Gondara. Um, as, as we all know here, this, this, this uh, ordinance uh, was uh, changed uh, this last week before, uh, after it was first published. And I just have a question about part of it. Um, there is some sections in there that are un underlined, and I was wondering why they're underlined. Can somebody from staff, Mr. Feely or somebody, explain why we have some parts underlined? Mr. Messenger, hello. hello. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council members. Mr. Messenger, there is a, a button there that you can raise the podium so you're not hunching over. Oh, okay. You can, do you see it? It's to, is it to their, his right? Yes. Yeah. Right. On the right. At the bottom. The right. That light, yeah. Oh, where it says up? There you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. Awesome. There you go. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members. My name is Robert Messenger. I'm an active transportation coordinator in the Community Development Department. And all of those bold, italicized, underlined comments were in the original draft document. Um, staff uh, took those out and those were reinserted by the mayor. And so he, he put those in, um, and he underlined, bolded them, and italicized them so that you would know that those were reinserted. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Councilor Storm. Mr. Messenger, I have a, a comment or a question. This will be the fir considered the first read, correct? Yes. And then it will come back December 20th, and at that point you should receive, we are able to receive public comment. Now, is there an opportunity for public comment in, um, like at, in the form of, um, well, there always is, but uh, sorry, never mind. I'm just gonna, sorry, no, no, thank you very much. Okay. I do have a question. Yes, Councillor Flores. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Messenger. Um, I'm uh, looking at page 664 of 676 um, regarding uh, Council Bill 22012. Um, I'm looking at the whereas and the therefores. Um, so my question is that it's to codify resolution 09-301. Um, I tried, I, I wanted to see what 09-301, that resolution passed in 2009, um, to see what the language was. And um, so my question to you, um, and it would just be a good faith, you know, I would take it in good faith for you to educate me and, and, and let me know whether um, the codification which exactly would be the codification? Exhibit A with its amendments and it's several, several pages. It's like about, I don't know, uh, 15 pages maybe. So is that the entire uh, municipal code? Those 10, 20, 10 to 15 pages, uh, Mr. Messenger? Um. I mean, it's... Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councillor Flores, yes, that is correct. The entire ordinance is the preface section with all of the whereases, as well as Exhibit A. So those two components comprise the entire ordinance. And then the other question I have is, um, since the, the, uh, well, the resolution was passed in 2009, but since then we also have our... Um, Elevate Las Cruces, our comprehensive plan. Was any of that taken into account in designing this ordinance? Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilor Flores, yes. Those um, elements were taken into account okay. in drafting the ordinance. All right, so um, I have a couple of asks, and I think it'd be good for all of us, well, maybe not good for all of us, but it would be good for me to know um, 
What I, I would like a copy of the zero nine hyphen um, zero nine hyphen three zero one. And I'd like to see the references made to the um, Elevate Las Cruces, because when it comes to codifying anything here on, especially with our complete streets, uh, I would hope that um, there, you know, the safety issues, and not public safety, because most of our public safety in our Elevate Las Cruces has to do with, you know, police and that kind of safety, but um, in terms of smart, you know, streets, complete streets, um, to have that. And so, um, I, I, so, yeah, and I'd like a clear description on, um, I don't know if this would, this would be the time or place, but um, I mean, if this would be the document to make sure that we have um, yeah, that, well, I, I would like to see all of that. I would, I would like to see how much of your proposed uh, ordinance um, is consistent with uh, Elevate Las Cruces, because it, since we adopted it a few months ago, it now becomes mandatory. So I just want to make sure that it's included in all of this. And Mayor. thank you, Mr. Messenger, and thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Flores. Mr. Messenger, did you have something to say? I just Ma heard. Yeah, Mayor Pro Tem, Councillor Flores, yes, I'd be willing to do that. And when um, would that be um, appropriate to bring that on the 20th, or would you like that sooner? It would probably be appropriate on the 20th. And then if there are any questions um, uh, pertaining to that, uh, then uh, that would be the place for other councillors to ask. So I, I think that would be, well, definitely, you know, provided prior to the meeting would be better. <laughs> you know, it'd be, it'd be good to have that as soon as possible, quite frankly. And thank you very much, Mr. Messenger, and thank you again, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor Flores, Councillor Sorg. Thank you, Ma uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, there was, there was something that in the first version that caught my eye and how the order in which the paragraphs were put in and the, the uh, title of the or, or, uh, paragraph, whether it be a letter or a number, they weren't in the right order. So I was just wondering if that got changed when, uh, when this was done, and I see it hasn't. There's, there's in section, oh golly, what section is Section three, there's an A and there's a B part, and then uh, then there's another B part. So could uh, staff get that cleaned up before it brings it back? I mean, is that okay, Mayor? Uh, is that okay, Christy, Christine, to uh, clean it up now for the next meeting? Do we um, have to do a, a first reading yeah, again? Yeah, Councilor Sorg, um, you would have to amend it to make any changes to what was already provided in the packet. Okay, we'll, we'll do that next time then. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, uh, Mary Pertem. Thank you, Councillor Swark. Any other questions regarding this item? Okay, seeing none. Okay. Bring it forward. <laughs> Yay, bring it forward. Thank you. All right. Um, next on the agenda, City Council Member Board Reports and Comments. Um, I, I guess it's my turn, <laughs> I'm starting. Um, I'd like to talk specifically about the public comment related to um, the options for our restaurants, specifically by the Belgium to <clears throat> continue with the tents. Um, I, in, in light of COVID and the, the new variant, I'm, I'm hoping, Mr. Peely, that we can Re-examine it, and you know the the tent situation for all of our restaurants, not just that one specifically. Um, and I'm recommending at least six months, even up to a year. I don't know what that it requires. Um, it, is it a, a form of a resolution or working with community development? But I think it's an important thing. I know of many. Um, 
of, of many folks that um, find it much more safe to um, frequent um, and, and that particular uh, establishment, but others that are outside that prefer to sit outside rather than inside. And I know with the colder months, that's something um, that I wanna um, insist that we do moving forward and hoping that you will have those conversations and bring it, I don't know if you need to bring it back in the form of a resolution or not, but that would be my recommendation. Um, I also would like to, um, and I don't know where the more appropriate policy review committee is or if I need to just work in conjunction with, Ms. with Sergio, our policy analyst, to discuss looking at that particular um, item and, and, and what it would what it would mean to strengthen that membrane section, right? Because it, it feels, I mean, I've read it, but I, I'm not, that's not my expertise. I think it's very ambiguous. Um, and maybe it might mean strengthening it a little, strengthening it to fit um, specifically um, a commercial or resident, um, commercial um, to include um, places like restaurants and so I, I don't know if I, that's what I would like to do is work with said Hill. Um, I don't know if it's with the changes in our code that we're doing now specific to com community development um, and maybe that's something that they're they're looking at um, but I'd, I'd like to talk more specifically about that because I think if we can be flexible um, in that to to that it, it might um, increase right economic <laughs> development for folks. Um, I know there's other states that have kind of that year round sort of tent situation, but I know some of our codes to include maybe the international code, um, it, it doesn't allow for that. So I'd, I'd like to maybe have a, a more um, robust conversation with you and Mr. Nichols um, and moving forward related to that. Um, Attended the tree lighting ceremony on um, um, Saturday. It was nice to see the public out, beautiful um, the tree and all the decorations. So my hats go off to, hat goes off to, I have several hats, um, go out to um, staff um, for a great event. I know of so many people that were um, really excited about being out. Um, the other thing I wanted to make mention is, um, I said on the Economic Development Policy Review Committee, one of the things that we have recommended as a policy review committee is working with staff to address, um, in, in the event there's a public sale of property, we have to wait, right, the real estate, we have to wait 45 days, which is sometimes a, um, it prevents, I think, um, um, companies feeling positive about doing work with us, right, working with us. And so we're looking at bringing a resolution um, specifically to council to address that uh, resolution to the state legislator to, to look at that. I know that staff is, is working with um, Senator Hamlin and related to changing that particular law. And so I wanted to, bring that to your all's attention in an open forum. I think it's it's imperative that we look at that, change that. Um, I, I hope, Councilor Beta Stuvi, that that is a conversation that we might have with the Municipal League as well. Um, I think it's an important thing. I, I, I think staff, um, what staff indicated was it was something, this particular item has come at least twice to the legislature, but has not gotten momentum and actually has gotten voted down. And so it would be interesting to hear from other right communities like Albuquerque, Santa Fe, some of the larger counties in the east side, um, that what their thoughts are about this. Because I think when we you know, work together in the various counties, we're just stronger for it, um, especially bringing economic um, opportunities to the state. Um, they're all st staff is also working on looking at all the various codes and resol uh, ordinances, resolutions, um, things having to do with the industry that um, 
pre prevent or, or lessen, right, the effects of economic development because of, of inflexibility in our codes and whatnot, and we're kind of developing, I think, a list of things so that we present to the governor. As you recall, the governor had a press release maybe a couple of months ago related to um, her uh, having her state departments looking at all those areas where um, all those departments that, and, and different rules and policies and laws that um, prevent or are a deterrent to economic development. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Councillor Flores. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so um, this past week was very, uh, in a, w was actually wonderful. Um, on Tuesday, our um, Parks and Recreation Committee held a meeting um, in my district, um, but it was actually concerning Gill's district, um, the Chandler uh, tank refurbishing or whatever the word might be for that. Um, as some of you may recall, there was, uh, never mind, let's not go there. Um, at any rate, um, it was absolutely wonderful. There, was a, there were a lot of people in the community from District 5, so Gil might want to share more of that, but, um, but the uh, concept of uh, making it uh, a park area and uh, restoring the, um, the tank uh, was amazing, and hopefully um, it'll be something that the city can complete within a year or two. Um, and then on, on Thursday, December 2nd, um, I want to thank Jamie for bringing together um, a wonderful, fantastic, very successful meeting. There were uh, 75 people showed up. Again, it was in Hacienda Acres. And um, I asked Jamie to uh, coordinate a meeting so that the residents of Hacienda Acres um, could understand what, it's, what, it, what it will mean to uh, have septic tanks uh, removed, the costs, um, and the whole thing. So, um, so people from utilities, uh, Delilah Walsh was there. Thank you, Delilah. Um, Carl Clark, her deputy uh, from utilities, was there. Uh, David Cedillo from Public uh, Works was there. Adrian Widmar from, um, from Utilities, uh, Kevin Wilson, Natalie Green, and Isaias uh, uh, Amaya were there from, um, from, actually it's now Economic Development, they, they were previously in uh, uh, Community Development. And um, so the presentations were absolutely wonderful. Um, between uh, the uh, nuts and bolts that was really carried by Carl and, and David, and, um, and then Kevin and Natalie uh, did a great job of letting people know that there's money there. And as Natalie said, well, we have an RFP and there's CDBG money, and it was like speaking in Chinese or Greek. It was like Greek to me. I mean, it would have been Greek to me if I weren't a city councilor. So uh, it, I did explain to them that, because um, she couldn't go into some details, but um, I did say that. And then uh, Delilah made a lot of clarifications too. But people, uh, people I think, were absolutely um, happy. I mean, it was really, everybody, the, I mean, it, the meeting was supposed to start at 5.30 and end at, um, what was it, 5.30, 6.30, 7.00 but I think we, we left the Sage uh, Crest uh, uh, Library, a uh, little dining area for, uh, anyway. Uh, we left there um, close to eight o'clock. People wanted to know uh, exactly what it took and, and Natalie and they had it all organized. We'll probably have another meeting. Uh, Natalie and I talked about it this morning. She said that if she knew that there was going to be so many people there, that they would have set it up so that people could actually do their applications because for the CDBG grants. And then they were anxious about that. 
Uh, but it was explained to them that the ARPA money, yes, you know, there's a finite amount of money, uh, ARPA money for the um, septic tank removal and the implementation, the sewer lines and the hookups to the, to the, the homes. But um, then it was explained that community development block grant money was renewable, so um, it'll probably be possible. I can't say it will be absolutely possible, but probably possible for any kind of work that goes on in Hacienda Acres regarding the septic tank replacement um, project uh, would be funded for those who qualify. Um, and it looked like a lot of people there thought they qualified. So um, I wanna thank Jamie Rickman again for putting together a fantastic team. I wanna thank uh, David Cedillo, Jamie Rickman, Adrian Woodmark, uh, Carl Clark, Delilah Walsh, Kevin Wilson, Natalie Green, and Isaias, uh, Isaias Amaya. Um, and, uh, and yes, the lighting ceremony on Saturday was absolutely fantastic. And uh, for the first time, the mayor had uh, four city councilors storm the stage to be with him. <laughs> he said he would introduce us from the audience. And so I organized the storm and I said, this is going to be a storm. We are gonna get up there and just show our happy faces. So um, it was really beautiful and I hope you all enjoy uh, the, the plaza in the coming weeks. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flores. Councillor Sork. Thank you, um, Mayor Pro Tem Gondara. Um, just a couple, three different real quickies here. Uh, I just want to add on to what you said, Mayor Pro Tem, about the uh, state law about selling pro public uh, properties. Um, that 45-day process was done, was, was uh, started back in the 1970s, and the threshold for implementing that 45 days was $25,000. Well, we know property values have gone up, and so that's what we're looking for, is to increase that significantly. Um, and yes, the Chandler tank, uh, we had a, a lovely uh, uh, public meeting, a lovely community meeting out at Sage, uh, Sage Cafe, and um, got a lot of good input, in, and so um, the park at Chandler tank is on its way. Um, and then lastly, uh, just a few words about electrification. Um, uh, more and more vehicles, as you know, are being out, put out in the market for uh, electric vehicles now. Uh, they're gonna become more and more available as time goes on. Um, and also the s HVAC systems that you have in, in your houses, they're coming, the, the um, uh, it's not ground source or, or geo, it's, a, it's an air a system where it takes a heat out of the outside air or cold out of the outside air to heat and cool your house. Those systems are coming down in price as we go along uh, more and more. They're more common up north where you have heating is more significant than cooling, um, but uh, the, the same system does both and they work similar. Um, and that's gonna be important for our LMI uh, folks that we have in, in the city here. And I'm sure that once it gets past Congress, cross our fingers, there's going to be some little help for these electrification systems in, in our homes and in their businesses and all buildings. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Councillor Soar, Councillor Bincomo. Thanks, everyone. Um, yes, I have a couple comments. Um, I really want to thank Officer Anaya with the Coats Department for taking me on a ride along last week. Um, he is incredibly kind and compassionate and very good at his job and I just really appreciated him spending a whole morning with me. Um, part of what came out of that are two things that I would like to address today. Um, one of them is um, the property specifically at 1212 Brownlee Road um is no longer just a nuisance or ugly it is dangerous it is right next to macarthur elementary school it has been burnt up when we pulled up that day there was someone unfortunately using it as a uh, shelter 
I walked in for two minutes, people should not be in that house, period. Um, it's completely unsanitary and not okay. But the worst part about it is that while we were sitting there, you know, officer had to call LCPD for backup to get the person out. While we were, sit while we were sitting there waiting, the security guard at MacArthur Elementary School came over to talk to us and he was telling us that he tells kids that if they don't see him at the corner, to walk around the entire block to avoid that house. That is not okay. To me, this isn't even, I mean, beyond the issue be, being an issue of it being dangerous, it's an issue in equity, and we would not allow that in certain neighborhoods. Why would we allow it in that neighborhood? And so it's just, you know, I, th I think Officer Anaya is sort of done everything he could, and it's really incumbent upon us what we do next with that property. And so, um, over there shooting eyes at legal, but um, I would really like us to take action on this property beyond what has already been taken. It is absolutely dangerous and we should not wait till something worse happens with one of the kids at MacArthur to actually take action. Um, on a bigger spectrum, besides 1212 Brownlee, I have talked to Aoife about this before and even in my budget conversations with Barbara and her team, I would like to officially begin um, organizing an, an ad hoc committee similar to the process we held for um, El Paseo South Solano for West Picacho. Um, it is an area that is blighted. It is an area that has not gotten enough attention in um, a significant amount of time. I have spoken with some business owners who um, and residents who are very interested in taking part of something like this. Maybe Mayor can join this one since he couldn't join the last one. Um, but I would like it to be a similar process. And because the uh, El, El Paseo South Solano is, you know, we're looking to appoint someone to that already, perhaps that person can um, support the lead of this other one as well. It is very similar process, very similar um, issues happening around the West Picacho area that need to be addressed. And, and I'm, I'm gonna make it you know, a top priority for me as long as I'm on this council representing District 4. Um, and so I would like to start moving on that um, quickly, soon, um, and start appointing some folks to that committee. Um, I, yes, I would actually just like to agree on the outdoor, the outdoor dining issue. There's still a public health order. I think it does not make any sense to um, stop outdoor dining. It's counterproductive um, to the, you know, to the hard work folks have been doing in New Mexico to mitigate um, COVID. So yes, I think we need to figure something out um, quickly. And honestly, I feel like COVID has changed so many things that, you know, going back to, well, this is how we used to do it before COVID just doesn't make any sense anymore. We have to adapt to a whole new way of life now. Um, and I think, you know, I know that there is literal international codes here, um, but I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to, um, to set precedent for how we react to situations like this. So I'm absolutely in favor of that. I wanted to say, again, also a huge thank you to um, all of the staff that had anything to do with the tree lighting ceremony. It was incredible, it was beautiful, it was clearly missed by the community. There were so many folks out there. Um, and I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone and of course our community for coming. And then lastly, I wanted to congratulate Miss Elizabeth Teeters. I don't know if she left already, but I hadn't had an opportunity to see her um, and congratulate her on her new role. And Ifo, I sent you an email, but I said, you know, I see you and you're building a bench and pulling people from within and I think that's really commendable. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bencomo. Councillor Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I will pass for today. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Vasquez. Councillor Abeta Stuvi. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, last week was busy for going to events. Um, I did join uh, Councillor Sorg at the Oral and Facial Surgery Center of New Mexico, where Dr. Heiner and um, a panel awarded uh, a new smile to uh, one of our local community members named Valerie. And so that was really great to see. Um, I also joined in for the ribbon cutting for the I-25 and University um, Interchange. It's so beautiful. Um, the artist work is lovely um, by Colette Marie and she's local to Las Cruces. 
and it's just really wonderful to see this project um, come to fruition. And then I joined for the, um, goodness, for the Christmas tree lighting. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, and on Saturday, we also had a um, master plan meeting for Gomez and Fringer. Um, so I really wanna thank Kathy Matthews who helped facilitate with the consultants. Uh, we had a uh, nice turnout uh, for community members that were specially interested um, in the Gomez area. And so we got some great feedback um, and some good history. Uh, one of the main points and concerns that was listed by a few individuals was that of drainage um, at the two areas. At Gomez, it was um, more specific to drainage um, from the park into the neighborhood and there being backups in some of the, I guess the draining in the pipes. And so there's been a concern um, and a consistent complaint um, that the individuals have said that they've um, reached out to the city before on that. Um, and then with Fringer, uh, there's a lot of ponding and there's a lot of mosquitoes. And so that's becoming an increasing problem uh, for the neighborhood. So, um, and I wanna thank the, the Parks and Rec as well. I believe they had a couple members there and for all the work that they had to do bringing all the holiday cheer to our community and to the downtown. Um, I was able to sit on a panel a couple weeks ago um, to help uh, choose a new uh, community schools manager who will be starting on December 13th and we'll be able to announce that to everyone. And then last week we did have our health policy review committee where we had an update on our mobile crisis units and proposals um, with Chief Smith. And at this time the model will look to becoming internal with social workers and a combination um, with the EMT firefighters. So we were able to get um, briefed with uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Councillor Flores on that. And thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for your comments earlier about the property items. I will actually be going to Santa Fe um, actually after this meeting and meeting with the Municipal League as well. And so I'll bring up those comments. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abifas Tuvi. I, I have one more item that I failed to mention, IFO, and I'm seeing this. Um, there have been in our um, pocket parks some events that have been wonderful for the area, but there have been some issues with um, not having proper um, amenities like the the restrooms and um, things of that sort, uh, things that are um, based at what I what it appears like um, a process that's supposed to be followed with time frames and whatnot, and the event um, sponsors having music later than they've said, um, and so I feel like there's a disconnect from having these events and maybe having the proper. Um, the proper uh, impl um, staffing there to ensure that right everybody is aware. If some if you need something, these are the numbers you call. If there's an emergency, and maybe it's there, but it, it feels like I don't know if there needs to be a staffer there that sort of is is monitoring the situation, ensuring that that people are there that's supposed to be there, that all the information is being given. If someone has a complaint, that they know where to um, um, place a complaint or lodge a complaint with. I, I think it's to have an, an event, and I'm talking more specifically in the Klein Park area, and not have restrooms um, there for an event that's more than three or so hours is, and then hearing that, um, folks unfortunately are urinary, urinating in other people's property and such shouldn't be happening and that has been sort of a topic of, of concern uh, for many of my constituents specifically in the, in the um, Klein Park area. And then to include the plaza events where um, are occurring but maybe bricks and mortar merchants aren't aware that they're going to close the roads down um, and, and from some people's perspective, um, it reduces the, the number of folks frequenting their, their business. So um, that, that 
uh, those are things that I was dealing with the latter part of the week. Um, and I, I don't, I, I, I'm thinking um, there just needs to be timely communication um, and opportunity aside from not just the folks that are um, not only organizing, but renting out, right, the, the staff from the other side, renting the plaza out, but what all needs to happen to ensure that our, our bricks and mortar merchants are, are aware of what's, what's happening. And then lastly, I've been asked um, for the city to um, sponsor the chili drop, and I'm hoping that we can get monetary um, funding to the downtown partnership to really, um, make this a, a, an incredible event, it usually is, and as you know, our last year was done virtually, so we're really looking forward to um, this year's virtual, um, excuse me, this year's in-person event, so I'll be talking to you more about that um, individually. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, Councilor. I, I, forgot, I forgot an item also. Okay, sure, absolutely. Okay. Originally, I was going to um, read um, a couple of items that were in yesterday's newspaper, uh, one was a, uh, an article or a LTE um, by Melissa Ontiveros. Well, actually, she's a columnist. Um, so she, it was about the gun violence um, epidemic and, um, and calling, on, uh, calling on us as, as a culture, as a community, um, to do as much as we can. Um, she states, quote, uh, gun violence reverberates throughout the community as a chair of the Behavior Health Coalition and the former Public Health Association president. I know all too well the consequences of gun violence and the trauma it can create. It's critical our state addresses both gun safety and access to mental health resources as we face youth gun violence and one of the highest rates of gun suicides among children in the country. And she focuses this on secure storage as being one of the simplest methods to prevent gun violence. And then an article, uh, excuse me, a, 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 an LTE, not an article, piece. But this is not a piece, this is a LTE, letter to the editor by Dr. Paul O'Connell, uh, O'Connell. And um, interestingly, um, that they ended up in the newspaper yesterday, and uh, a columnist is anticipated, but I know that it's submitted at least 10 days before, or I think I know, uh, 10 days before, and LTE sometimes up to two weeks. Um, but at any rate, um, he is calling out to treat gun violence as a health issue. And, um, so he, um, um, you know, he, he cites some examples of how there are certain states that are allowing people to walk in public without a permit or training, uh, walk in public with, uh, uh, with arms. Um, and then he, um, he does refer, oh, he does refer to the Oxford High School in Michigan and uh, how he has the, data wrong, he says uh, there were actually four people who were shot, four students, I think ages 14 through 17, and then he injured another seven, or I don't know, they're still in the hospital. But at any rate, I just wanna thank my uh, fellow counselors for um, accepting the, ex uh, the consent agenda item, and wanna thank uh, Sergio Ruiz for drafting the resolution that we approved today. Uh, it does have the directive for it to be sent to um, the state legislature um, with a request that gun safety um, be addressed by the legislature. So thank you, Mr. Grease, for that work, and uh, I'm done, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Flores. Ifo. <laughs> thank you, Mayor Brotam and Council. Uh, just a couple of items, uh, I just wanna address the the temporary structure situation, with, uh, especially, particularly with Bite of Belgium. I mean, Mayor Pro Tem and I and, and Larry and Eric had a meeting, as was mentioned with them. Uh, so, uh, so technically, they, they, you're allowed to have structures, right? Outdoor structures. It's the it's the fact that they want to keep it temporary, 
and there's a cost associated. I mean, that's really what they're, they're talking about. So we would gladly have these structures out there. It's just we're worried about the safety. It's the cold protects, uh, protects our, our residents. And so, um, you know, there's a temporary, I believe it's a 180, 180 days which is a, is a temporary allowance for that. Uh, I think by the Belgium, we've given them, it would be a year uh, with the six months extra so they came, they already had that, um, I'm looking at there just in case I'm saying anything out of the line here, but they did have, they were approved and then we gave them an extra six months. Uh, but it, that's what it comes down to. I mean, we, we would love to have them have the tent, uh, but we, we need to make sure that the people that go and frequent the place are, are protected. And the only thing we have to go off of is the code. And the code is what we've adopted and um, so anything outside the code, I always, you know, I always pass the buck <laughs> because as a city manager, you know, it's but I always say it's above my pay grade when it comes to approving things that are outside the code. I never want to get into that. Some some situations, I, I think I'm afforded the the, the autonomy, the the, uh, the right to do that. But um, but we'll work with them. I mean, especially if there's some some support there, if we can figure out a way to. To, to ensure the safety of our of our residents, um, but that's 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 what it comes with. It comes with a, a liability there, but also true safety. So we talk about the winds here. Um, there's a certain amount of requirement there to anchor it down and restrooms, ADA, all those things that are required, you know, by the code that we adopt. And so we'll we'll get you know get with Larry we'll get some more thoughts on that but that's really what it is we we would love to to help have them keep their tent uh, uh, but we just want to make sure it's safe um, I got this this uh, announcement from from Jamie Unidad Park I think uh, Mayor Pro Tem is speaking at the um, the event honoring the history of the park December 8th uh, from 10.30 to 11.30, you think this is an event where people are able to share stories, and so just want to make that, uh, make sure everybody knows about that. Um, an update from our police, we have 34 cadets to start uh, the academy, 70% are college graduates. So uh, thank you to the council for approving their incentives, and looks like it's working. It looks like it's, uh, we're down to 30 vacancies, uh, appreciate of course, police and, and all the work that they're doing on uh, the community advocates have been hired. Um, I guess this chief just mentioned it's something's in my queue that I need to approve. So uh, um, we'll make sure that that, that goes through. Um, I also wanted to mention our federal lobbyists. So we've, uh, we've identified a group, Amy, uh, Larry and I, we've interviewed. Um, couple of firms and, and we've identified, because it's below the 75,000 threshold, uh, the one that we've identified, we, we don't need to bring it to council. Um, we, we feel like we can absorb that in the budget. I gotta check with finance. If, it, if we don't, we, we will have to bring it back to council for a budget amendment, but we can certainly have a, a work session to, or an, an item where they come and, and sort of present who they are and introduce them, themselves to the council. Um, and then just wanted to give you a heads up. I know the minimum wage increase is, is uh, set to, to take effect in January. I just want you to know our HR and our finance team have been, been on it, uh, Barbara and Leanne, and, and uh, HR has been pretty busy uh, with all of this. But the, the proposal that came to me was, of course, not only addressing the salary changes that need to happen mandatorily because of the state, uh, but increasing it to $15 an hour. And so we looked at, uh, they're looking at a, a consultant has, has gone through and presenting numbers to implement that. And from what I gather, it, it might be pretty reasonable or it might be doable. And so I appreciate, like I said, our finance and HR team working on that. We want to lead this, you know, the, the goal is to lead the state, lead the, everybody's talking, and it's an opportunity for us to just do. Uh, but. But not only, not only that, it's really, it's really about getting competitive. I mean, there's, the, there's that leading the state and, and making sure there's a living wage. But honestly, 
we're going to go there one way or another. Um, it's just a matter of of when, just because of the inflation, and we got to get more competitive uh, as a as a city. And uh, I think I think that's all I. I think that's all I have. Uh, just one more thing on the temporary structures. I don't know if that needs to be passed the resolution. I can, we, if we figure something out, as long as I know there's support there, we can come back and just make it some internal policy, especially if we keep the temporary nature of it, um, maybe extending that, but it has to be just the policy that's written in um, so that we're consistent across the board. But that's all I have, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Ethel Pately, I appreciate it. Anything else? Okay, Christine, move to adjourn. Yeah, motion. To, I'll second the motion. Oh, I can't first. I can't I'm sorry. Help. I can't. <laughs> um, Councillor Sorg, will you motion to adjourn? Okay, I'll second. second. Councillor Flores. I got myself a little worked up here. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. This is on the motion to adjourn the regular meeting. Councillor Beta Stuby? Yes. Councillor Vasquez? Yes. Councillor Bencomo? Yes. Councillor Sorg? Yes. Councillor Flores? No, I want to stay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. And Mayor Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs>